الجبن والبخل اللهم عافني في بدني اللهم عافني في سمعي اللهم عافني في بصري الجبن والبخل اللهم عافني في بدني اللهم عافني في بصري اللهم إني أعوذ بك من الكفر والفقر اللهم إني أعوذ بك من عذاب القبر لا خلقتني وأنا عبدك وأنا على عهدك ووعدك ما استطعت أعوذ بك من شر ما صنعت أبوء لك بنعمتك علي وأبوء بذنبي فاغفر لي فإن وأنا عبدك وأنا على عهدك ووعدك ما استطعت أعوذ بك من شر ما صنعت أبوء لك بنعمتك علي وأبوء بذنبي فاغفر لي فإن وأنا عبدك وأنا على عهدك ووعدك ما استطعت أعوذ بك من شر ما صنعت أبوء لك بنعمتك علي وأبوء بذنبي فاغفر لي استغفر الله الذي لا اله الا هو الحي القيوم واتوب اليه استغفر الله الذي لا استغفر الله الذي لا اله الا هو الحي القيوم واتوب اليه اللهم 
له الملك وله الحمد وهو على كل شيء قدير سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد عبدك ونبيك ورسولك النبي الأم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما عدد ما أحاط به علمك وخط به قلمك وأحصاه كتابك ورضى اللهم عن ساداتنا أبي بكر وعمر وعثمان وعلي وعن الصحابة أجمعين وعن التابعين وتابعيهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم 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 صلى 
sallallahu ala muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa sallam sallallahu ala muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa sallam sallallahu Sallallahu ala Muhammad Sallallahu alaihi wa sallam Sallallahu ala Muhammad Sallallahu alaihi wa sallam Sallallahu ala Sallallahu alaihi wa sallam Sallallahu ala muhammad 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 Sallallahu alaihi wa sallam Sallallahu Sallallahu ala Muhammad Sallallahu alaihi wa sallam Sallallahu ala Muhammad Sallallahu alaihi wa sallam Sallallahu ala Sallallahu alaihi wa sallam Sallallahu ala muhammad 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 Sallallahu alaihi wa sallam Sallallahu Sallallahu ala muhammad Sallallahu alaihi wa sallam Sallallahu ala muhammad Sallallahu alaihi wa sallam Sallallahu ala muhammad 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Fidaw Sati, you can stop the Quranic citation. Yes, thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, I think the speaker is already here for Dr. Mansu Ibrahim. So we will start uh, our webinar today. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Associate Prof. Dr. Mustafa Ma Muhammad, the former director of Center for Islamic Economics, Kuliah of Economics, uh, IUM. Uh, all members of uh, Prof. Dr. Mansur Ibrahim, sorry, from International Center for Education in Islamic Finance, in SEF, as our speaker today. All members of Friends of Center for Islamic Economics, lecturers, and finally, to all of our delightful participants, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and welcome to the second day of series of webinar workshops in Islamic Economics Research 2021. My name is Wan a PhD candidate in economics from Kuliah of Economics and Management Sciences, IUM, and I will be your MC for today. Before we begin our program, let us start our session by reciting Umul Quran Al Fatiha. Dear all participants, to recap from the yesterday session, we have gone through the sessions on conceptual concept of some economics and finance, and the importance of forming the correct summit worldviews or understanding at the first stage before developing any economic models. Those sessions have been delivered by Prof. Dr. Muhammad Asam Hanif and Associate Prof. Dr. Mustafa Amwa Muhammad. Now, for today's sessions, we will move towards applied areas of economics. Our session today will involve Prof. Dr. Mansur Ibrahim and later Prof. Dr. Mabi Ali Muhammad Al Jarhi, which are very crucial to be understood to bring those uh, conceptual models of yesterday's sessions into applied models. And hence, uh, before I hand the session to our well-known speaker today, Prof. Dr. Mansur Ibrahim, let me introduce you a bit about him first. Prof. Dr. Masu Ibrahim is currently the Deputy President, Academic and Dean of School of Graduate Studies in, from, uh, in International Center for Education in Islamic Finance in SEF. He received his PhD in Economics from Washington University in St. Louis in 1996. He teaches mostly quantitative courses such as mathematics for economics and businesses, statistics and econometrics at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels. His areas of interest are monetary economics and time series analysis of macro macroeconomic and financial data. His publications appear in various internationally reviewed uh, journals, including, among others, Journal of Banking and Finance, Economic Modeling, Journal of International Financial Markets, Institutions and Money, Pacific Basin Finance Journal, Energy Policy, Renewable and uh, Sustainable Energy Reviews, Singapore Economic Reviews, as an Economic Journal, and many more. And he also uh, involved in Journal of Asia Pacific Economy and Journal of Forecasting. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Professor Dr. Mansur Ibrahim to give his talk entitled Using Applied Econometrics in Islamic Economic Research Tips and Guides. Please welcome. Also to the participants, please open up your cameras so the, the speaker can interact with you during the session. Thank you very much. Jazakumullah. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wassalatu wassalam ala asrafil anbiya wal musalin. Wa ala alihi wa man tabi'ahu bi ihsanin ila yamiddin. Rabbi israhli sadri wa yasili amri. Wahlul Uqdatan Min Lisani Yafkuhu Qawli The MC uh, And I heard uh, Dr. Mustafa uh, 
and all participants assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh i have I try to see some names uh, but not many that i'm familiar with except i think zuls uh, uh, right uh, I, i think zuls uh, from the bank before and my students before uh, I, I, yeah I, i think so right uh, and thanks uh, to to you for, for all of you for inviting me uh, to share a little bit on the, the applied side the, the, the econometrics uh, side uh, the applications of econometrics in the islamic economics right? now when i look at these topics right, and my first impression will be quite difficult because i think you you all know more about islamic economics than me Uh, because Islamic economics is not my area, but they do uh, read articles uh, that have been written. Right? Uh, but then I know a little bit more uh, regarding econometrics uh, that hopefully that I can share with you, but how to apply that into something that I am less known of. Right? So uh, what I would do in terms of this case, right, let me share first uh, my, 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 my screen. Right? So, What I would do in this case, uh, in, in providing presentation to give introduction first, but uh, just to put some scopes uh, in my discussion when I think, when, when I say applications uh, of, of uh, econometrics to Islamic economics, uh, which uh, we see right now uh, in the knowledge is more or less applications of econometric in Islamic banking and finance. So I'll try to, discuss from, from that context, right? And the second part, right, when it comes to tips and guides, for example, I, I, I will not be able to give you a very detailed or specific tips and guides, right? But then I will try to provide you general principles uh, or general tips and guides if, for example, in case that you opt for quantitative methods and Uh, in using quantitative method, you resort to econometric modeling uh, to look at or to understand certain economic phenomenon. Right? So that, that basically uh, what I would do in terms of focusing on the general principle or general guidelines, or at least what you must have. Right? Because the notions that many people might have when it comes to econometrics, right? you will see some people totally uh, Uh, put econometric aside because they're full of mathematics, statistics, and so on. And for some, it seemed to be too difficult, right? But for others, right, they take this one to be too easy. Too easy, not in the sense that they are able to do it, but they view econometric as a way of uh, putting data in the software and then uh, push the button in your notebook and get the results, as easy as that, right? Easy in terms of applications, but not easy in terms of understanding the knowledge of econometric itself. So what I'm going to go through uh, in my presentations, uh, in my presentation, I'll give you a little bit of the introductions, uh, which try to uh, uh, put a scope of my discussion today. And I will share with you a little bit uh, some research issues that in Islamic banking and finance mostly, or in finan Islamic financial economics, if I, I would like to stay in that way, uh, not so much in the other areas of economics, and I will, I will give you the reasons why, and then uh, I will pay more attention to providing guidelines on how to apply uh, econometrics, right, or give you the principles. Right? And if any one of you have uh, more specific questions, we can uh, discuss in the Q&A. Hopefully, if I can uh, finish before the 90 minutes, for example, we, we will have more time to discuss or, or for me to address whatever questions that you have that are very specific uh, related to the techniques, right? uh, related to certain questions that you might have. Because normally, when students approach me, try to ask, Uh, about econometric, they were asked regarding the results, they were asked regarding the methods, regarding the data, and so on. But those are so details that I will not be able to uh, discuss in my presentation today. Right? 
So, and then I will conclude uh, uh, with, with uh, certain words uh, for you to bring home uh, after I have presented everything. Okay? Now, if you look at the meaning of econometric itself, right? just to look first at the meaning of econometric itself, right? Now, econometric is nothing more than measurements of economic theories, right? Or to put in a broader term, measurements of theories. Right? We try to measure theories, right? And in the measurement of that theories, we employ certain techniques, right? And certain procedures to make inferences, right? So econometrics have to be taken as a tools that you use, right? a tool that you use. Now, I know that you have discussed uh, about uh, the knowledge, right? And the Western knowledge and the Islamic knowledge, uh, how both of them relate to value. But I'm not sure whether I should attach the value to econometric or not, uh, whether econometric is driven by value or not, because these are the tools that have been developed to measure whatever theories have suggested or have stated. Right? There are techniques, right? And, and we are going to look at in the context of these uh, techniques, right? how we can apply them uh, to make inferences, because at the end, we would like to come up with the conclusions. Now, as I mentioned, we will try to apply this to econometric, to Islamic economics, right? Now, if we look at the term Islamic economics, I, I'm not going to try to define what Islamic economics means, right? Because I know that all of you uh, being uh, research students, Right, PhD and, and some maybe master and, and know more the, or know in more details regarding what Islamic economic means. And in fact, you have uh, listened to uh, basically the two uh, prominent individuals yesterday the, in, in the area of Islamic economics, Prof. Aslams and, 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 and uh, uh, Dr. Mustafa uh, Omar. You, you have listened to them and then you are going to uh, listen one more after me, uh, who are who uh, are very prominent, right? Who is very prominent in Islamic economics, receiving I think uh, uh, the IDB awards, and this year also received uh, the award from ICAM Turkey uh, due to his contribution in Islamic economics, Prof. Uh, Ma'bid uh, Jarhi. Right? So I'm not going to to pretend that I know about Islamic economics and I can define them. But then when I look at the word of Islamic economy itself, uh, economics is a study of human behavior that we try to study human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce means. And this definition has been provided by Robbins. And then of course, in many textbooks, you may find out that there, there may be different definitions, but more or less the same. We try to look at how human behavior that, uh, take decisions uh, in order to resolve the problem of scarcity in order, in order to make the ends, uh, where in the context of general economics that we, 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 we know of, the ends that people try to achieve is to satisfy certain unlimited, and uh, they put the word unlimited ones, right? So that economics in general, right? And of course, economics has various branches, right? Have, uh, in the context of the theories itself, you have micro, you have macro, and then you have the branchings of economics into publics, developments, internationals, right? and financials, monetary economics, and so on. So they have so many branches, so a well-established body of knowledge, right? And now you have Islamic putting in front of economics. Right? It's basically, when you say Islamic, right? you are Islamic or you are not Islamic, adherence and abiding to Islamic laws, norms, and values, right? And we have the word Islamic economics, right? We have the word Islamic economics. And few have tried to define Islamic economics by trying to reconcile these two, right? reconcile these two. And, and something quite difficult in terms of reconciling these two, because as what you have heard uh, from yesterday's sessions, that economics uh, coming from the Western uh, thinking is loaded of value. Right? And, and you have the word, you have heard the word corruption of knowledge and so on, but then Islamic try to purify that, they right? try to Islamicize that. Right? And by bring back to uh, the principle to adhere to or uh, abiding by the by the Islamic law norms and value. I, some have defined, but when I look at definitions that has been given, uh, uh, sometimes quite difficult for me to bring back into 
how to link it back to econometrics, right? Uh, for, for, for example, in the context of one definition that I have looked at uh, in terms of uh, Islamic economics by Prof. Arif, for example, is a study of human behavior. Uh, it's basically uh, a study of Muslim men so, uh, that are imbued with value. Uh, that, that basically studied of economic behavior of Muslim men that are imbued with that are imbued with values. Now, if we try to confine economics, Islamic economics to the Muslim man only, then uh, it's quite difficult to understand the whole phenomenon that has taken place because our aim is to look into the whole phenomenon that have taken place, try to explain them and try to improve the conditions and so on. So, but then, so I will leave aside that one, but I try to uh, basically uh, focus more on econometrics because when you have tools, I would say you can apply tools uh, anywhere, that right? as long as you have theories right, that you can uh, that you can use as a basis for the measurements, right? a very simple way that I have defined econometric measurements of theories. Right? And, and as I said, I'm not going to define the, in, in detail Islamic economics. Like, uh, for, for me, quite difficult to to define it. And I think, and you know more that in terms of uh, what it mean by Islamic economics. Uh, does Islamic economic fulfill the requirements of econometric that anything coming from Islamic economics or there are certain things, certain, certain predictions uh, or certain implications coming from Islamic economic can be tested, then I would say economic, econometric theory can be used uh, or can be applied in order to address whatever uh, predictions or implications coming from the Islamic economics. Right? And at the other end, the, I believe that Islamic economics is not all about uh, uh, all about right or wrong, or something permissible or not permissible. Where at the beginning, uh, many of us or many of our pioneers discuss right, in terms of what are allowable, what are permissible, what is right, what is wrong. But I believe that Islamic economics is more than uh, identifying right and wrong because with within the options, or sometimes in the context of comic, we call feasible sets. There are a lot of alternative uh, causes of action that can be taken where all those causes of actions are permissible. And we need to choose which one will be the most ideal one against the objective of Islam, for example, or against the Makassib. So, so basically it's not a matter of right and wrong. So looking in that sense, then we can subject Islamic economics or the predictions coming from Islamic economic to testing, right? And the manifestations of Islamic economic in practice, as we, what we observe today, has been in the area of Islamic banking and finance. And, and these are, they have attracted a lot of uh, empirical attentions, right? And for example, in recognitions of the, this area of work, or the contribution that has been done, for example, in Islamic banking and finance, the IDB also have awarded the, the, the prize to uh, basically the expert in Islamic finance that have conducted a lot of empirical work for us to be able to understand the, what is going on and how to improve uh, Islamic finance. And that to uh, Prof. Kabir Hassan that, that we know of a few years back uh, before uh, the, the, the pandemics. So which means that the, the area of Islamic banking and finance is fairly recognized and Islamic banking finance is nothing more than uh, uh, part of Islamic economics because the basic principles, the world wills, uh, the basic foundation principles is the guidance or basically the foundations for the developments of Islamic banking in practice as well as Islamic finance. So these are the, uh, uh, this is what I try to lead you into in, in the sense that when I discuss the tips and guide of uh, applied econometric, I try to focus more on what people have done in Islamic banking and finance and what we need to do, right? If, for example, we would like to apply the uh, econometrics, right? In our thesis or in our research work. And I do believe that some of you, uh, that, that later on maybe you may want to share when we discuss or in the Q&A later on, that I believe some of you have interest in Islamic banking, Islamic finance, or the, 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 the new terms, the new word coming up, the new segments that people pay attention. But this new segment is not new because it, 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 
it, it had been there before, even, even before the model design banking in Islamic social finance, right? the zakats and the Aukah institutions and many other institutions right? that, that, that were involved in the transference of funds from those who need, uh, uh, from those who have surpluses to those who are in need, but this transfer of funds uh, are not related to business activities right? or, or indirectly related, just the transfers of funds for simply the Aum or mutual assistance. So that Islamic social finance that has been incorporated in, and more and more people are looking at the Islamic social finance. But at the moment, I, when it comes to research, if you would like to look at how the research in Islamic banking and finance right, uh, evolve, right? And if you have any topic under Islamic economics, then you, uh, we may discuss and, and you may share, but let it go on. But then under Islamic banking and finance, uh, if you look at the way that uh, the whole research has been evolved, I, I list some of them here just to give you some idea, uh, uh, just to give some idea what are people looking at in the context of Islamic banking and finance. And the way that people try to look at it become more details, more depth right, with the broader scopes, have more implications into the well-being of society and, and into uh, have more implication to the global economy and so on. Right? In, in the early years, right, in the early years of, of uh, uh, sorry, in, in, in the early years, right, we focus more on building the concept, building the theories of uh, Islamic economics. Uh, what are theories? Uh, we, we discussed a lot on, on those things. So th this go far, far back in the early 19, uh, the 19th century. Right? So go far back there that people discuss. Right? And, and the, main, the main concern, of course, during that time is basically the, the interest rate or the riba elements that have been uh, ingrained in, in society uh, that we have to get rid of. And, and that's why the, uh, basically when it comes to uh, the focus uh, that, that people have at that time is to establish Islamic banking that is free from interest rate. Right? And as time proceeds, right, we have more and more data because econometrics right, is useless without having data. Right? We have to have data. Right? We have to have observations. As data become more and more available, the interest becomes the evaluating the performance. Right? of Islamic institutions, either Islamic banking, Islamic capital markets, or even Takaful, people look at performance. Okay? And at the first, they look at simply the financial performance, and then they proceed to look at many other aspects of uh, those Islamic financial institutions. And, and, and the main themes during that time, right, after when we have few data available, is to make comparisons between Islamic bank, conventional bank, Islamic finance, and conventional finance. Right? And I think uh, that that uh, process or that progress in terms of the research, empirical research is, is, is basically natural. Uh, one, you have data, and Islamic banks are still new during that time. Uh, Islamic capital market starts to, to develop uh, with the index that has been, uh, with the screening criteria as well as index that has been developed. The first thing people would, would like to know, of course, what, what would be, what is the difference between what has been, what, between Islam, the new uh, Islam, Islamic banking uh, with the uh, well-established conventional banking. What is the difference? People would like to know, in the, especially in the context of performance. So that normals, right? And once people have more and more data, different aspects of performance have been looked at. Uh, if, if you look at one of the articles uh, on written, uh, not, not by, by even Muslim uh, economists, but by the by Western financial economists is on performance on a broader scale. I look at efficiency, look at uh, stability, and look at uh, many other things, uh, business models of Islamic banking and try to compare with conventional banking. And, and, and that I refer to the work that has been done by Beck et al. in 2013. So very widely excited. If you write something on banking, for example, uh, normally this article will not be missed uh, as part one of the citations, right? So that early work coming in in the year of 2010, right? Uh, more and more work and go deeper, right? Uh, go deeper. And last year, for example, one more uh, prominent financial economist from the West looked at liquidity creations of Islamic banking. So basically the focus before from looking at the comparative, looking at 
is Islamic finance in comparison with conventional finance have evolved into focusing specifically on Islamic finance right? without having without making comparison to conventional finance. Right? Why? Because Islamic finance have its own issues, its own problems. Or to put in a different setting, have its own critical foundations that it needs to be evaluated separately. Right? So that revolution have taken place right? and have attracted a lot of attention, not only from Muslim economists, but also from uh, non-Muslim uh, economists. Right? And this uh, basically is reflected by a lot of special issues coming up uh, of papers that people write on Islamic banking and finance. Right? And now, as, as more and more data become available, now people are interested in looking at the contributions. Right? So before, the, the focus has been on financial side, but now, right? more and more work try to link the financial side of Islamic finance to the real sector, okay? So basically now where the, we will have Islamic, if I want to put in that way, the word Islamic in front, Islamic financial economics, right? Or Islamic monetary economics, right? And in the last two years, the, I was requested to be the line editor, uh, which is to edit the book. And the title of the book, Islamic Monetary Economics, quite interesting books right, that has been uh, written uh, by the, the Bank Indonesia, which is Central Bank of Indonesia. I think last year, but I'm not, uh, 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 last two years. And this year they asked me to uh, line edits, uh, to provide the editing services uh, for the book that, uh, that has been uh, written by staff of the Bank Indonesia on Islamic financial instruments. Right? But all those two books were written in Bahasa Indonesia. So some of you that know uh, Bas, uh, Malaysian language or Malay language, for example, we are interested in Islamic monetary economics. It's quite interesting that has been written by the, the Central Bank of Indonesia. Right? So people more and more try to look at linking. Right? linking. Right? Now we have, we have to link the, 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 the Islamic finance in the real sector try to look at implications, look at the monetary transmission mechanism, look at how you affect the real activities and think a uh, few works coming up from IUM, the staff IUMs, especially from Prof. Serena Kasim, for example, try to link Islamic finance to real activities, right? And, and, and try to look into how Islamic finance can contribute to the shared prosperity in the context of income distributions, right? The work uh, by Abidifa, at all 2016, uh, coming up in Jebo and on the poverty itself. Right? And in, in my area of interest, we asked me, for example, what I'm looking at and try to link uh, basically the Islamic financial system with the concept of pro cyclicality, right? where pro cyclicality is the feature of the conventional banking system. Right? But if we get rid of the banking system, your know, conventional banking system or conventional financial system and replace with what, for example, with Islamic financial system, can we mitigate the problem of pro cyclicality? That if we can, why? And we cannot, why? For example, that what is my interest. And I published a few articles in the context of pro cyclicality. So these are basically the, the interest that we have right, in Islamic banking finance, more and more try to link back right, on. Islamic finance, right, link back to Islamic finance as a part of the real sector, because evaluation of Islamic finance will not be complete right, without looking at Islamic finance within the context of the whole institutions that that financial activities take place without linking back to uh, the, the real sector right, or, or the Islamic economy ecosystem. Right? And, and something that struck my mind because I was in the UAE in 2018, right, representing INSEF uh, for, for certain awards that INSEF received, for example. And that the first time in that year, I looked at the report uh, of the Islamic economy. Right? I look at the report of the Islamic economy. Right? And Malaysia is number one in the ranking in the reports uh, based on the score that has been given. And Malaysia is far ahead in Islamic finance. Right? But when I look at any other areas, Malaysia is not far ahead, Malaysia below. Malaysia number one is just because of Islamic finance. Right? When they put the aggregates, they make Malaysia to have, Malaysia have the highest score in Islamic economy, but they are backward in all other areas. 
So if Islamic finance basically supporting the real sector, what struck my mind that contact is why then in Malaysia other segments of Islamic economy is also is not at, at the forefront. Supposedly, if Islamic finance is linked to the real sector, for example, then Islamic finance should support the other sector and bring the other sector at the forefront, but not in the context of Malaysia. So that some some research issues that struck my mind in that time uh, when it comes to uh, Islamic finance. So moving forward, I would say people try to look more and more in terms of the contribution of Islamic banking finance. Like people try to look at how Islamic finance can basically uh, can basically assure a more stable future for example, or at least can minimize uh, basically the instability that have taken place that we have seen for the past uh, so many years, especially after the break, uh, break the breakdown of Bretton Woods system, right? Where all nations uh, basically uh, move into uh, flexible exchange rate regimes. Right? Well, not all nations are bad. Where the, 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 the big nations move into more flexible regimes. And, and the fiat system come into full force right? after the breakdown of Bretton Woods system. So people try to look for, well, can, can Islamic finance be the alternative? Like, can Islamic finance ensure or, uh, the, the stable future? Can Islamic finance mitigate the boom bust cycles? Can Islamic finance right, stop the process of financial accelerator? So th these are type of questions that uh, we, we are interested in to look at in the future. And if these are the interests that you also have, for example, try to understand uh, the link between Islamic finance and the real sector, how it works, how it interacts, right? And, and so on, does it work and so on, and then econometric would be a useful tool for you, right? But if you are still uh, interested in looking at uh, the Islamicity of the products, right? Whether allowable, not allowable, permissible, or not permissible, Islamic or not, Islamics, then uh, in that context, uh, econometric will not be uh, useful to you, right? So because uh, for me, for example, when they look at uh, the research that has been done so far, of course, very important because the foundations is that we have to be clear on what is allowable, what is not allowable, permissible and not permissible, but then at the same time, right, we should not start at the arguments of Islamic or non-Islamic. As I mentioned before, there are so many things within the allowable sets, right? Uh, we so many things within allowable set we still need to address, right? Because uh, in the economy itself, there are alternative causes, actions. And if we look at even allowable set or allowable causes of actions, what we term as normally feasible sets, there are many options to choose from, right? So we have, sometimes we should not ignore this uh, various feasible sets available there for us to choose from, right? And the important part, Islamic economics have to come in, uh, but uh, it depends on the way that you look at the meaning of Islamic economics. For me, for me uh, when I try to look at Islamic economics, right, and try to resolve uh, uh, the, 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 the choice that needs to be made, right, try to resolve the, the choice or the optimization that needs to be made across all potential choices that are available out there, I look at Islamic economics more from the institutional point of view, right? where Islamic economics provide the principle, the foundations that define certain things uh, that you can do and you cannot do. But then when it comes to choosing the options or choosing uh, certain causes of actions, I will look at uh, what are the causes of action that are available and are allowable and which ones would be the best one. Again, certain objective, right? whatever objective that we would like to set. Right? Because I do not see that uh, if someone try to maximize the profit is a wrong objective. I also do not see if someone tried to mi minimize the objective of its own, right? Of his own, as well of as well of society by internalizing externalities, for example, right? Externalities in. So I, I, I do not see also a problems, right? Because these are objectives that need to be set, right? Because sometimes we 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 put too much expectations, right? To, to, when we try to evaluate certain phenomenon in a sense that we try to make people to look very Islamic, right? very Islamic. But then to, to fulfill the Islamic principles, there are certain minimum criteria that need to be put in. Uh, for, for example, I just give you a very simple example. Right? Islamic banking come 
under a lot of criticism. Why? Because Islamic banking doesn't contribute much right, uh, to society, for example. But then if you look at uh, what are the minimum contributions that must be provided by any business institutions, right? uh, we cannot expect Islamic uh, banking will resolve the whole problem of society. But as long as Islamic uh, banking institutions contribute to uh, and meet the minimum contributions or the required contribution to society, for me, that would be sufficient if they do more. And that one, the Ihsan is coming up from Islamic banking institutions. Okay? So those are things that we really look at. Okay? So basically, when we want to focus on the issues, I look more in the context of uh, how they are, the interrelations between uh, the financial markets and more specifically the Islamic financial market and the real sectors. And in fact, there are so, so many, uh, so many, so many, many uh, issues out there that we, we need to resolve, right? And, and one of the things also that I may share with you here, uh, the issues that I'm interested in financial inclusions, right? And, and sometimes uh, we Muslim have the habits of uh, basically taking recommendations uh, from uh, the West, right? despite the fact that we say that the West uh, have all kind of uh, all kind of value value loaded right? and corruption of knowledge. Uh, what they have done when they take our knowledge, when they took our knowledge, they modify, they put their values, despite of having said that. But every time that uh, the West come up with certain recommendations. We tend to embrace it, right? We tend to embrace it without looking carefully, right? And that's why you see that even many universities in Malaysia, even international Islamic universities, for example, embrace uh, basically SDGs. Right? We embrace SDGs. And the way said, okay, in order to enable SDG, we have to have financial inclusion. And you see that every individuals now, that every many people, many Muslim economists now said, right? Islamic banking, Islamic finance contribute to financial inclusions. We try to make Islamic finance relevant in the view of Western economies. Right? For me, if you do that, for example, uh, and then we are not going to do uh, a good service to Islamic banking finance. What we need to do, we need to evaluate. Uh, we need to put in uh, the evaluations whether financial inclusion is good for us or not. Look at the core definition of financial inclusions. And that we require econometric to look at. In what way financial inclusion is good? In what way it may not be good to uh, our the, our economics, uh, our economy, for example. Okay? So these, these are various kind of things. Right? Being researchers, uh, what I try to bring up here, basically being researchers, we should not take whatever people have provided you uh, for granted. Right? The same thing. I I I, I uh, give you, explain to you various type of issues here. You should not take as true or as the right one. You should take that as an issue that worth to be investigating and try to search for the answer on your own. And econometric can help you to provide the answer if you do things right. Uh, if you follow certain tips that I will try to provide here uh, in, in my presentations. Okay. So those are basically the, 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 the uh, research issues that we are looking at in Islamic banking finance. If you want to apply econometric, if you ask me that what to focus on or what are the advice, general advice that I will give for those who, uh, who uh, want to use econometrics in their research, right? Now, I have practiced econometrics uh, ever since I got my uh, PhD in 1996 and, and all my works uh, uh, basically apply the econometric tools uh, to address certain economics problems, right? And when I joined INSEF in 2011, I started looking at Islamic banking and uh, developed my interest in Islamic banking because that is close to my uh, areas of interest, which is monetary economics. So I look at banking, uh, uh, Islamic banking, and have written few articles in Islamic banking. Now, if you ask me, what are the general principle or guideline that I will provide say, for, for, for you uh, if you want to embark on uh, using econometrics uh, in, in, in addressing whatever research objective that you have, right? I will give you five. I will not more, go more than five uh, due to uh, the time that we have, right? And the first one right, is the theoretical foundations. 
like theoretical foundations, like put heading theoretical foundations, uh, or, or, or basically the, your, your reasoning, your predictions regarding the behavioral relations. Right? Now we can use econometrics, I'll, I'll go into more details one by one, right? So, but let me uh, list down first in terms of uh, the area of tips and guides I, I, I would like to provide you that in the context of using econometrics. First one, theoretical foundations. That, and the second one, you have to understand the philosophy and objective of econometrics. Right? And these two are basics. Right? Are basics. It's true for all other applications, not just in Islamic economics. We have to understand what are the philosophy and what what are the philosophy and objective of econometrics? Why econometrics, right? So we have to understand fully. It's not a matter of getting data or any data put in software, right? And then put some quotes and get the results. No, it's not just a matter of that. You have to understand fully, right? The philosophy and objective of econometrics, right? And then once you understand these basic foundations, right? You have to learn the approaches. You have to learn the technique, you have to learn the stack, you have to learn the procedures. So I will discuss it a bit in the context of the approach, right? And then you must have rigor in your analysis. And I will discuss, provide some tips, how to be rigorous right? in our econometric work, right? in our empirical works, right? And try to look at in the context of uh, conducting what many people say robustness, right? robustness checks of your results, right? If you want to apply econometric work, come up with thesis, come up with articles, come up with papers to publish, for example. If you do not have number four, right? Then more likely your paper will be rejected by good journals. Uh, and I mean, good journals mean journals that are indexed, right? Journals that are reputable, uh, not predatory journals and not below average journals, right? So basically, the, when it comes to uh, publications or disseminating, right, I do not want to use the word publication because sometimes uh, we may take it wrongly that publication is the end. But then, in fact, publication just means of disseminating the knowledge that we have, uh, uh, that we have uh, basically found right, uh, in, in our research. So we have to disseminate the results. But the best medium to disseminate result is in the journals, right? basically that are widely distributed and widely read. And the journals that are widely distributed and widely read are those top tier journals. Right? So it's basically, sometimes people have a, a misconception regarding publication in good journals, uh, where people see that these are the end, but the answer is no. Right? Why we want to be in the good journals, right? because these are highly disseminated, uh, widely read by many other researchers, widely read by policymakers. If you want to have your work to have impact, because at the end, any publications or any research work that you have done, if they are in, up in the shelf, have no impact, no one look at it, no one cite, no one expand, that works uh, is basically can be used close to uh, being useless other than giving you the degree. Right, but have no impact to others, right? So these are really important part in terms of looking at the rigor. So I will try to give some tips in the context of how to get rigor in our analysis, right? And then the final one that I will discuss a little bit in terms of uh, intuitions and implications of your works, right? Uh, basically, the, any work that you have done, right? You have to be able to answer, so what questions, right? I have this finding, but then, so what is so important about that finding that you have made? And that's very important in terms of uh, applying right, the applications of econometrics because econometrics is just not taking, right? It's just not, not taking the models, put in the software and come up with the results. It's not just that you have to start from the beginning up to the end, so end to end. That right? you have to build a solid understanding of these five uh, tips and guides that will try to provide you uh, if you want to practice econometrics, right? you have to understand the critical foundations, philosophy, objective, approaches, rigor, intuitions, and implications. Right? So those are uh, basically what I have uh, uh, here. Right? Now, let's look at one by one. 
right? Now, if you look at the way I explained econometrics, right? For you to be able to apply econometrics, right? You must have, right? You must have variables. You must have data, right? To put it in a very simple form, right? You must have data. And applying econometrics means that you try to look at relationships, right? You try to look at relationships between variables, okay? Sorry, Prof. Yes. Uh, do you accept questions in the middle of your lecture or you want to wait for question at the end of I, Yeah, can, can. I, I can accept questions uh, at the middle. And in fact, my, my apology, anyone can interrupt me at any time. Uh, no problems. Uh, I, I will be happy to, to address uh, whatever you have or to listen to your views. Because as I mentioned, uh, the, the, what I have discussed so far, for, for example, uh, especially when I touch on Islamic economics, I may be wrong because I know less than uh, what you may know regarding Islamic economics. Yes, I can accept the questions. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. So uh, any participants would like to ask, please maybe just open up your mic and then make your question short and brief. Lah. Okay, thank you. So anyone uh, would like to ask anything so far? Maybe oh, now, Tade, maybe after, after this, good Prof. Oh, 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 let, let, let me ask, right? Because I try to gauge uh, how many of you that have the same interest as mine, right? So uh, how many of you are writing or plan to write some things uh, on Islamic banking using, using data, right? Anyone? So many, actually. Uh, uh, but you guys can tell the two Prof your uh, yeah. dissertations, yeah. Uh, for, for your information, I supervise two uh, of IIUM students uh, now completing uh, under have already been submitted and waiting for uh, for for um, waiting for examination results or ex examin examiner's feedback. I, I, I supervise two. Uh, one uh, on rural Islamic banks in Indonesia and the other one uh, on Islamic banking in Malaysia. Right, so so but I, I did, I do supervise, I have been requested to supervise students at IUM too, right? But then uh, but no, normally the, if I say yes, I will say on the, something that I'm very interested in, right? So anyone would like to share uh, in terms of uh, your work or any, any other work that you use data, for example, right? And data means that you put a model together and use econometrics. Uh, anyone? Anybody, please? If for me personally, Prof, yeah, uh, yeah. my dissertation will be more on the behavior of the economic agent. Okay, I try okay. to replicate, uh, perhaps it is a still a very simple model, but uh, since this is in Islamic economy, it will be new model. It's like uh, we want, we would like to identify uh, what are the behavior of the economic agent towards uh, economic, uh, economic, more like economic subject matter, like to wealth and everything, like consumption. Uh, we would like to see whether there are differences in terms of the, uh, you know, the values of the, you know, like Keynesian consumption, uh, not Keynesian consumption, something like that. Okay. Yeah, you have to look further. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the data I will find is trying to find the data of the consumption, the behavior of the consumption, and put in the model, and see whether there are differences. The way we consume, the way we save, and the way we spend our uh, our money and the income, something like that. Okay. Okay, but yeah, but. Okay, it seems that everyone uh, not willing to share, but then one principle of, of, of research basically we have to share, in fact, right? And, 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 and to share your, your idea, to share, uh, to get feedback, and more important, to get feedback, right? And, and in one of the memo, uh, that one of the books that has been written by, uh, I forgot the name, he, 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 he is also Nobel Prize winner, uh, and he is a professor at the University of Chicago, right? 
So he said that uh, basically why he left the University of Chicago so much because of the informality. That informality means that because of the informal interaction that have taken place between him and his colleagues, between him and his students, where students can catch him, can caught him, uh, can catch him during the coffee breaks. He can catch some other colleagues at coffee break and discuss the ideas. Right? And normally the ideas coming out from the coffee breaks or from the lunch times, right? This is the idea that in up in the student thesis, right? And, and not uh, basically the, from the classroom. Rarely you get the idea from classroom, right? Uh, believe me. Because classroom pro just rehash what has been summarized in the books and what has been summarized in the book is something 10 years in terms of knowledge, right? So it's basically you have to catch these persons, uh, the professors and so on. Why? Because professors, they read up-to-date articles. Hopefully, like what, what I say, they read up-to-date articles. They keep track of their own areas and so on. And these are basically the type of uh, uh, people that you have to, 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 to catch and try to uh, tell them your ideas so that you can get feedback, right? So normally, out of the class, you will get the, the ideas on how to do research. Yeah. I see one, one, one person raise hand, please. Please uh, unmute um, um, yourself. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam. Um, I just want to ask, like, uh, just wondering, um, like, Islamic economics has started long back. Uh, and now when we are uh, doing research, um, part of the, uh, the literature review, we need to write about theoretical framework. Uh, in theoretical framework, we refer to theories, but the, those theories most are conventional like western theories uh, mm -hmm. why don't we have like our own theories okay it's and, fair. Uh, yeah. oh, sorry uh, one more question um, and now i'm doing in islamic bank and finance but in takaful i'm writing okay. i'm trying to develop a model in micro takaful for the poor um, yeah. part of developing a, a model i think there is a step uh, I need to follow. Yes. So it's not uh, clear for me what are the steps, are those steps that I need to follow. For example, if in science or mathematics, there is model to build a model, you need to do these steps. Thank you. Okay, but can, can, can you give me a little bit more information when you said you try to write the models for the uh, What is the objective of your research? Um, uh, actually, I want to build a model to allow um, poor people or low-income uh, group to get insurance, health insurance. Okay, so now you, you, you try to come out more with the products, in fact, what type of yes. product they need to de be developed uh, for, for poor people to be able to be uh, placed under Takafu, right? Uh, yes. so, so, uh, micro Takaful actually will be built yeah. on a uh, community based micro yeah. Takaful. Sure. Okay. Thank, thank you. Now, I think uh, the, the two for uh, what you have asked are, are quite related. But then uh, when it comes to the topic that I'm uh, basically uh, the presenting right now, right? I think the second one you have to look at. Let, let me explain this one first, right? And, and then try to look at. Uh, whether uh, econometric can be used, for example, uh, to develop the model that you try to develop or not, or that one you have to approach in, into diff you, you have to approach uh, in a different way on on how to develop the models, right? Uh, and in fact, developing the model as what you have mentioned is not my area. I do not know exactly because that are more of product developments, right? And and more of getting of new products, testing the products, verify the products. Uh, whether it is basically acceptable or not, or uh, will be accepted by the market or not, and so on. So those are more of that different area. Right? But the first one that you have asked, quite interesting, because I have raised the same thing here. Can we rely on existing theories right, as foundations to empirical analysis in Islamic economy and finance? Right? So, so can, can we rely on existing theories? Right? Now, if you look at uh, what I try to bring in, right? Very important, right? 
if you want to apply econometric, very important, you must have critical foundations. Uh, econometric is not about getting data on one variable and the data on other variables without having prior expectations, okay? without having prior predictions of how those two are related. Okay? So basically when we try to apply econometrics, normally the, the, the objective of the work that we do will involve one variable that we call as outcome variables that represent basically behavior. That outcome variable represent behavior, right? Or the result of economic behavior, right? Put very simple one to one that we know of GDP, for example. You have Y represents the real GDP, right? And then you have the X, right? And let's say the X here is Islamic banking developments or Islamic banking or Islamic finance right? or Islamic financial developments. So you have the X. So you try to link those two together, right? You have Y, you have X. And you, have, you try to measure how close the link is. Is the link positive or the link negative, right? So you have one variable that you try to understand, right? uh, its behavior, right? its behavior. Because one thing that you observe, for example, through time there are changes in GDP levels, through time there are fluctuations, right? and there are disparity across different nations. So you put certain hypotheses in and you try to look at whether the Islamic finance contribute to that movements in GDP or not. Right? How strong the contribution of Islamic finance, right? And what is the contribution of Islamic finance to GDP growth, for example? So these are the questions that can be addressed by econometrics, right? So if you want, if you want to have, to use applied econometrics, you must have this stated explicitly that you have two variables together, okay? or more than two, it can be more than two. One is the outcome variables, the other set is your key variable that you try to evaluate how they are related to the outcome variables or the Y there. Okay? So these are subject of econometrics, right? subject of econometrics, try to look at how the variables are related. And of course, by saying this, right? this one may not fit your second one because your second one is basically you have to build up the concepts, you have to build up the models, you have to get verification from the model. In that one, mostly if at the beginning, right, it becomes basically uh, the developing a conceptual framework, con developing con the model first and try to verify uh, that model through experts. And basically what I try to say here, you may need to opt for qualitative type of studies, right? going for the interview, and, and, and get the opinion of scholars, go to the text and so on, right? To develop the models. But then for, for econometric to be used, more or less, basically, you must have the variables putting together. Now, as I mentioned, putting the variables together is not simply putting them. You must have theories that provide you prior expectations, how they are related, right? Or at least you must have certain reasoning in what way Islamic finance affect growth, right? From the reasons, you have to provide the arguments, not measuring yet, you have to provide the argument first, right? Because normally theories will provide us with testable implications. I think one mentioned in context of Keynesian consumption functions, right? And we look at in terms of consumption theory, right? The theory itself start with optimization problem, intertemporal optimizations of the consumers, where consumers try to maximize utility okay, by spreading consumption in year one, in year two, in year three, subject to lifetime constraints. And based on certain form of the equations of the ut utility functions, we can derive the consumption equations. And that consumption equation provide the predictions that consumption depends on income, right? So which means that consumption depends on income where the marginal propensity to consume is less than one. Right? In the same way, this is what we mean by theories. Right? In the same way, in terms of portfolio balance theories, for example, right? where individuals or firms right, try to allocate resources to various alternative investments. They are risk-free investment, they are risky investments. Right? 
and try to optimize performing what we term as risk return trade off. And those people in finance, they learn this risk return trade off. And from this risk return trade off, they derive the optimization, they, they, resolve, they solve the optimization problem and come up with predictions, right? That's right, uncertainty that have taken place. We reduce the holding of risky assets, right? We reduce the holding of risky assets. So we have to ask ourselves when we try to look from Islamic economics and Islamic finance, do we have that theories that provide that type of predictions, right? That type of predictions. So, so if we look at the theories of Islamic economics, right, the, I'm quite critical about the progress of Islamic economics theories because they stopped in 1980s, right? In 1980s, right? They are not able to provide prediction as such in terms of how one variable related to the other variable. If I ask you, for example, right, I'm interested to look at the impact of financial inclusions, right, which means that bringing people to a formal financial market, how this impact will influence the shared prosperity so that I can make assessment on how Islamic finance can contribute to the shared prosperity, for example. If I ask you, what are the theories behind that? Which means the predictions from the theories. Can anyone give me the theories coming from Islamic economics, right? For example, right? Some have tried, and I think um, Prohmabit will be in a better position to explain to you on how to develop later on, right? But some have tried in terms of incorporating, for example, zakat within the macro models. Some have tried to incorporate the uh, money in bank uh, or, 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 or Islamic finance, right? Within the within the uh, uh, demand and supply models, right, uh, and monetary policy uh, within the equity demand and supply models. So, so some have tried, but then there are not a lot that, that provide us predictions. The only thing that we heard right, or we hear so far in the context of Islamic economics, due to the, the value that we have, due to this, due, we should be different, right? We should be different, right? And, and, and that's what we have heard so far. But do we have theories that provide testable implications? Because if you want to apply econometrics, you must have theories that provide predictions. Right? You must have theories that provide predictions of the relationship between the variables, right? what the theories say. So, so, so you look at that context, right? you have to see. I give you one more example in terms of theories. Right? The argument that has been made, right? The argument that has been made, right? If Islamic bank is really interest-free, the, the, the profit rate of Islamic bank, right? Or the financing rate of Islamic bank should not be affected by the interest rate. So a lot of work has been done in this context, try to look at whether uh, uh, the, the deposit, uh, the return on deposit, on the return on loans by Islamic bank are affected by interest rate or not, right? But then what is the theory behind that? That's just the argument based on the principle that it should not be. But how do we know that this is the right predictions? And of course, it should not be affected. But if the financing rate of Islamic bank is affected by the interest rate, can we say that Islamic bank is not Islamic? What the theoretical behind it? So you, have, you need a theory very really clear cut, right? So, uh, so very important because right, in the context of Econometrics, right? Uh, 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 excuse me for 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 moments. I need to get a water. Okay. So, so uh, my apologies. So, so that's the important part, right? And and norm, normally, the, when we look at in the context of uh, applying econometrics, right? Uh, 
in, in, in many cases they have observed, we don't, they don't have, uh, the paper do not have strong critical foundations. And we have to understand the fact that theory without measurements, right? you come up with theory, a lot of good theory coming up, right? Without measurements or measurement without theory, right? those two will not be sufficient to explain what we try to understand, economic phenomenon, right? So it's basically, if we try to develop the field of Islamic economics, we have to develop theories. Right? And some develop theories, some go straight to measurements, right? But then if we have measurements at the end of our measurement, which means we apply a metric, we don't come up with the theories to explain, to generalize what we have found, for example, then it will not be sufficient. Both go hand in hand. And what I try to bring here, you must have that critical foundations. And the, the hints that I would like to give you here, when you try to understand something, try to look at alternative views. Do not stuck with one view, right? Because when you have one view, it influences the way that you do research later on, right? Because using kind of metrics, right? We have to wear the hat of being objective, which means uh, and, and instead of being normative. And I know that Islamic economy is very normative. Right? because they prescribe things, what should be done, what should not be done. But when you want to apply a kind of metric, you have to reconcile a little bit yourself, uh, or you have to moderate a little bit your normative hat, right? or you have to wear different hats, become very objective, right? because the kind of metrics is unlike uh, economics, right? econometrics is the tools. And to apply the tools, we have to be objective first. And to be objective, basically, one really important part you have to understand alternative theories that explain the theoretical links between the variables, right? Theoretical link between the variables, right? And, 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 uh, and in that context, right, due to the lack of the theoretical foundations, right? Or uh, the theoretical predictions coming from Islamic economics, right? The main thing that we have to ask ourselves, can we rely on existing theories as foundation to empirical analysis in Islamic economics and finance? Right? So these are something that you need to answer. Right? And some of you said, you said you have to rebuild the theoretical foundation from Islamic perspective, right? Yeah, if you can, because that one really important, right? Because you, you need to have the theory itself. Now, if I ask well, for, the, yeah, yes. As a reminder, we have 15 minutes more before Q&A. 15? Ah, yeah, because right now one, it's 10.32. We, we have one five more. Okay. The, Okay, no, because, so, because yeah. uh, later at 10 uh, 45, I mean, this is what in schedule. If you can change yeah. it, we no, want no, to have okay. QA. Okay. For 15 minutes. Yeah. So. so, so I have to go quicker, uh, basically. I, I thought that I have prepared very really short, so, sorry. But these are type of things that, uh, yeah, I will go through quite quickly. These are the theoretical foundation that you have to put in, right? uh, that you have to answer. Can we rely on existing theories as foundations to empirical analysis in Islamic economics? And I give you a very simple example. If you look at study that has been done on the impact of Islamic finance on economic growth, right? they rely on existing theories, looking at the functions of Islamic finance and how Islamic finance can affect economic growth, right? Because for example, when it comes to Islamic banking, the role of banks is what? Uh, pooling of fund, diversifications of risk, right? Processing of information. So Islamic banks do the same jobs and nothing wrong to do those things. Processing information, diversifications of risk, right? Because bank pool uh, funds from all investors or all depositors, small depositors, big depositors, and invest in various types of sectors, that diversifications, right? And bank process information is looking at which firm are more worthy to be invested in to lend to, lend to or to finance their, their investments. And that basically information processing and bank have economies of scale in terms of information processing. So that conventional explanation, I'm not sure whether this conventional explanation is acceptable or not, right? So you have to answer this part. For me, it's acceptable. But if I ask, for example, can Islamic Bank do a better job in promoting growth? Right? Now, being Islamic Bank, being financial intermediaries, right, we may rely on existing theories. But to answer whether Islamic Bank can do a better job, we cannot really, we have to have more explanations. 
right? And that explanation, theoretical explanation is needed that you have to find out, right? You have to come up. It doesn't have to be a full-blown theories first. It can be your arguments, your explanations. And that one very important, right? Because you must, you must have some prior expectation, theoretical explanations, right? And, and theoretical reasonings or, 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 the, or, or your, 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 your basis right? to explain or your, your hypothesis, right? So that that very important to have theoretical foundations. We can discuss more on this later on, right? Now, the second one that you need to know, right? You have to understand the objective of econometrics, right? Econometric is not to verify or to find evidence for what we believe. That is not econometrics. We try, we, we do not want to verify that because someone who wear the hat of econometricians, for example, the first word must be there is objectivity. Right? You have to forget first norm, normative judgments. Right? You have to forget first adjustments right? or normative view. But normative view will come at the end, right? Because at the end, when you apply any kind of metrics, you have to come up with recommendation what is better uh, that need to be done, uh, what should be done, and so on. You will come up with normative judgments at the end, right? But then, a starting point to apply econometric, you have to be very objective, right? And the job of econometrician is not to verify, to find evidence for what we believe, right? Because it's wrong to do that, in fact, right? I believe in this, right? I believe that money supply increase, the fear money supply growth create inflation. So I try to find evidence to confirm that, right? Without trying to evaluate, is there any situation that make money supply doesn't cause inflation, for example, right? So those are type of thing that we have to uh, look at when we start our econometric analysis, right? And when we look at, econometric, we try to, for the first thing, to validate which theory describe the phenomenon, right? So that's why we look at phenomenon that we observe, that we are interested in. Uh, we observe basically the crisis, the boom bust, the credit go up excessively and then have a sudden drop. And that have resulted in recessions. And we observe that phenomenon and we try to explain what caused that boom bust credit cycles, right? So you come up with theory. So there are a lot of theory coming out there uh, in the context of uh, market frictions and so on. And from that theories, they have predictions and we test that predictions. And there are alternative theories out there. We try to test which theory uh, basically that describes uh, the phenomenon that we observe. And more important, do not take chronometric just testing the theories. We try to create knowledge, right? Why? Because when we have data to describe the phenomenon, it's good to, to subject data to new setting, right? If the theory said that X affect Y positively, take that two data, but subject them in different type of setting. And that's why a lot of people work in this context. When uh, analysis that's been done for the United States come up with the answer of certain questions. People bring that analysis, modify a little bit and try to answer for Malaysia, try to answer for Indonesia, try to answer for Singapore, try to answer for uh, MENA region, try to answer for GCC region, try to answer for APEX, for example. Why? Because we try to subject the same finding to different settings, right? Unless until we verify, we value to different setting, we cannot say that we have good knowledge, right? But once we can verify the phenomenon that we observe, that we find in one case, and we try to subject to in different cases, different setting, in good time, in crisis time, in different countries with different type of regulations, and we get the results. That will give us a new understanding, right? And the main thing, the good thing, doing econometric is that, that you must find something unexpected, right? If you find something unexpected, I would say you contribute to the knowledge, right? But the problem that we have in writing cases, I know the problem that we have is two, right? It's two part. From your own perspective, right? If you find something that are unexpected, you are not able to explain, right? So that's why we try to find something that we expect from the theory, right? That from perspective of students, from the perspective of examiners that 
could make things harder for the students that if the thesis finds something expected, then the examiner say that you are not finding something new. Right? But if you find something new, which is unexpected, examiners will say that it doesn't make sense. It's against our understanding, right? So that the real dilemma that you have. But for me, right, if you apply econometrics and if examiners know econometrics, if you find something unexpected, but you have done everything right in terms of the application of econometrics, then it will say you have contributed to the new understanding, which means that you have come up with the knowledge, right? And I would urge you, right? I would urge you, if you want to apply econometrics as a basis, read this article that has been written in 2007, Objective and Philosophy of Econometrics, very important article in Journal of Econometrics by Anup Zellner. That very important article, six, seven pages, right? to bring you to the objective and practices of econometrics. Very important article, I would say, a must read for any persons that would like to apply econometrics in address any problems, that in address the uh, behavioral relations between variables. Okay? So that's the objective of econometrics. Now, econometrics have many different levels. I think uh, you may have gone through introductory econometrics, and then you have financial econometrics, you have, uh, you have uh, panel, uh, the modeling right, panel, um, econometric for panel data, right? You may have uh, basically non-parametric um, approach to the analysis. You have parametric approach, you have classical approach, you have Bayesian approach. So there are so many different type of approach of econometrics, right? But then the step in doing econometrics, right? You have to know that these are the steps, right? You have, again, emphasizing the fact that you must have theories that provide the hypothesis. And from the hypothesis, you have model specifications. You go through model estimation, evaluation, inferences, and at the end, you have implications. These are the steps that you have to go through and you have to go through religiously step by step. Okay? And model specifications comprise of variables that explain outcome variables. And those variables can be the key and can be the control. You have to look at functional form, whether it's linear or non-linear. You have to look at all the assumptions that has been made. And that very really important, right? And the variable that you put in, make sure you have theoretical backing for the variable, right? And functional relation is only local approximations. And that's why many people use linear. But the most important thing is the assumption that you make, right? Because any econometric models have assumptions. Understand those assumptions, very really important. Like these are the tips that you have to understand assumptions, right? Because Many, many work that has been done by students, they use very complicated, sophisticated techniques. At one technique, they just click the computers, but they do not understand at all regarding the assumption behind those methods, right? Behind those methods, right? And, and in fact, right, uh, your examiners or your reviewers can be naughty in terms of asking you to look at what go behind the methods in terms of the statistical theories behind the method. So you have to understand the assumptions, right? Because every model have their own assumptions, right? And with those assumptions, right, you have to address, you have to evaluate those assumptions before you can make any inferences, right? And one thing that you have to remember in terms of this case, right, practicing econometric or using econometric is not about demonstrations of the methods. It's not for you to tell people I use the advanced methods, right? Because these are just tools, right? So these are just tools. So just take tools as a tools. You are not demonstrating I'm using the advanced method. What you try to do, I want to address the objective to get certain understanding from this objective, and I use these methods. So the method is just me, right? And the method must be right for your objective, right? Must be right for objective. And that's why you have to understand the assumptions. And when you build the models, when you look at a problem, when you look at theories, check all the assumptions because everything have to be in sync, right? have to be aligned in the context of building uh, econometric models. So apply econometrics basically, uh, as I mentioned, it's not about using advanced method, but 
using the right methods. And there are so many techniques out there, okay? Techniques out there. There are so many, and that's why uh, for all so many techniques that are available out there, do not just learn the software, but learn the theories behind those methods. When I say theories, I mean statistical theories uh, behind those methods, which require you to understand basically the statistical assumptions that need to be made. Okay? So these are basically the, 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 the some sums of uh, the guideline that it will provide you in the context of applying econometrics. Right? If you have to focus, understand the methods and know the assumptions, uh, very important parts, because at the end, before you can make any inferences, your assumptions must be uh, right, must be validated. So you have to understand your assumptions. Right? And then the most important in any work, you must have rigor. Okay? Now, why you must have rigor in your analysis? Okay? Now, doing econometrics, okay? doing econometrics basically, when you try to build up the model to address your objective, you are going to face with uh, basically uncertainty, you are going to face with confusions, this normal, you have to have confusions. Okay? For example, the variable that you use, let, let's say, I try to explain poverty, okay? and I try to look at Islamic microfinancings and the size of microfinancing and try to evaluate in what way Islamic microfinancings affect poverty, for example. Okay? My confusions when I read literature, the first thing would be what are other variables to be included? What need to be added, okay? I want to explain poverty. Should I add education in? Should I add in uh, the, uh, basically the, uh, not only education, but should I add the government spending in? Because the government spending may be for the transfer and aid. Okay? Should I add globalizations in? Because globalizations also can affect the poverty of nations. Should I add this in and that in? So there are whole ranges of variables. You will have confusions, right? But then you have to start with something, right? You have to start with something. But then by starting with something, that starting point is not the end point, which means that in the back of your mind, you still have all many other variables that you may not have included for analyzing whatever variable that you are interested in, right? So there are a lot of confusion, a lot of uncertainty in there. And a lot of different views, in fact, uh, in terms of looking at certain problems. When it comes to equations, should it be linear equations? Should it be non-linear equations? Should I look at long-run equations? Should I look at the short-run dynamics? Right? Should I have dynamic term in my equation? These are just few questions that you have to raise. Right? When it comes to assumptions, right? the issues of endogeneity coming in, how should I identify? Right? Whether, right, in the same way that, that, that normally we, we, we sometimes right, misidentify, right? How do you identify that this shift in the policy rate reflect the shift in the monetary policy so that I can test exactly the impact of the shift in monetary policy on, let's say, a certain variable that you are interested, let's say, on the gold price, for example, right? So how you address the issues of your assumption, endogeneity, many other assumptions and so on, right? How you address the fact that your finding can be different based on different samples that you have constructed, right? My students have done uh, some uh, evaluations on using OIC samples, right? But one thing interesting that he found out is that once you take Saudi out from the sample, the result will be the opposites, right? So, so these are all type of confusion that you have. So what I try to bring you here, you must have rigor in your analysis to address all these uncertainties and these confusions. So that at least right, at the end, when you get the result, you yourself are convinced by the results. Right? So of course, in writing cases, writing article, you try to convince examiners, right? But being Muslims, right, doing research in Islamic economics, before you convince examiners, you have to convince yourself first. Are you convinced with your result that you have obtained? Because 
I know when you build up your research, for example, to a certain point, you have a lot of confusions. Do not know how to address. Okay? Uh, let's say in the context of the variables, you pick up only five variables, but you know that out there, there are 10 more variables that might be relevant. How you address incorporating all the remaining 10 variables because people might come up to you that say, you have missed out this variable and that's why the result look like that. If you put this variable in, your result may not look like this. How to address that? So that type of address, that type of uh, 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 approach or, or, or rigor, right? Or what we term as robustness must, must be in there, right? And again, one of the articles that you must read also when you try to apply econometrics is the article by Lima, far, far back, uh, 1983, published in AER, American Economic Review. Let's take the corn out of econometrics because there are so many corn in econometrics, right? Statistics is lies, right? The number doesn't lie, but people can use statistics to lie to other people. And that's why there are certain standards in applying statistics and econometrics. You cannot just put data in and get the result. You, put, you have to put data in and put rigor in your analysis. Look at different settings, look at different specifications, look at different assumptions and try to change a lot of things and try to see whether your main result remain the same or not. And that one very important part, right? Because there are so many corn out there, right? And that's why I never read articles that have only one table of results. I never read articles that do not perform robustness checks because that article that have only one result, one table result, no robustness checks, right, are misleading. Why? Because right, there are certain things that have been hidden, right, that, that have been hidden uh, by, by, uh, by researchers. Hey. Uh, Prof, okay. yeah. right now it's 10.51 uh, okay. because at 11.10 we have session with Promabit. Yeah. So you want to open the floor for Q&A or you want to finish? Yeah, let, me, let, let me finish in one minute first and then I will open the floor. Right? Okay. And then the rigor and robustness and finally the uh, econometric is more than significance. Right? You have to give the meaning to the numbers. And this one, I do not find... Uh, very rarely the students are able to give meaning to the numbers, but you have to learn to give the meaning to the numbers. You get the estimation of 0 0.7, what that 0 0.7 means, right? You have to give intuitions, a very important part, right? So, and at the end, you must be able to answer, so what's questions, right? the significance of the finding. And, and finally, let me lump up, right? Learn a lot of econometric techniques, right? Learn a lot. When I say learn, understand the theories behind them, right? Learn at least through software, right? And when you try to apply the objective, right? Sophistication of technique is secondary, right? You have to use the right tools to address the objective, right? And try to disseminate your results, sharing your knowledge through presentations and publication. That one would be important. And my apology that I'm not going to go uh, into detail. I thought that when I prepared these five tips would be enough for the time that has been given, but uh, surely it's not enough. Uh, but then we can discuss in the next uh, seven or six minutes uh, if anyone have anything to ask. And, and, and thank you to all of you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you to Prof. Mansur Ibrahim for your enlightening uh, lecture. There are questions I see in the chat, I will read to you first. In the meantime, anyone who would like to ask directly to Prof, you can uh, raise your hand. First question is from Sister Khairunisa. He, uh, she asked Prof Mansour, I would like to know your opinion. Several Islamic economic scholars in Indonesia recommend not using analytical tools that have independent variables. The independent variable is seen as violating the concept of Islamic economics because there is nothing in the world that is not influenced by something. The relationship that is more in line with the concept of Islamic economics is interdependent. What's your opinion about it? Okay, quite interesting right, that you try to bring in Islamic economics to the modeling side. Uh, now, if, you, if you look at, right, if you look at, of course, uh, uh, there are interactions between the variables, and that's why I mentioned in the context of endogeneity. The endogeneity itself is, is to, to capture, to address interdependence, right? Because 
and and I'm not sure when you say independent variables, what does it mean in that context? Right? But then uh, we do need to address endogeneity because uh, we will we, we acknowledge the fact that that we acknowledge the fact that basically uh, X affect Y, but at the same time Y can affect X. Finance can affect GDP, but at the same time GDP can affect finance, and that interdependent between those two, right? Interdependent between those two, and that need to be controlled for, right? Because what we are interested is if there exist exogenous changes in one variable, what might affect, uh, what might be the implications or the impact of other variables. Now, I disagree with uh, the scholars that say that. Uh, we cannot use independent variable because we have to control for something else. If we do not control for other things that affect, for example, GDP, like, uh, control for any other thing else that affect GDP, our estimation will be biased. And that's why I think you have to understand the theories because these are just the tools that uh, have certain theories behind it. And that's why you have to understand the theories. Without understanding the theories, we are going to confuse ourselves. Of course, right? The world are so complicated, but what is modeling is all about? Modeling is to simplify the complicated uh, system so that we can understand certain aspects. Okay? You, you don't have theory, you don't have modeling if you don't simplify. Okay? So, so that's why sometimes we are not able to understand everything because we think that by simplifying, we, are, we will not be able to understand. But not simplifying, in fact, makes you to not be able to understand anything. Okay? So that's a very important part in terms of the meaning of model building. So independent variables are there just to control for other effects that might influence the GDP or the your dependent variables so that that impact will not be absorbed uh, as the impact of your included variables. So that one very important. And this one, basically, the, 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 the interactive economic, they will tell about it. Right? The omitted variable bias, very important part. So there's nothing more than violating the principle of the concept of Islamic economics because uh, interdependent is not just the concept of Islamic economics, it's also in conventional economics. The whole thing are interdependence and that reality. But how to understand the complex reality, we have to simplify right, with the assumptions. But then we have to control for certain independence variables. Yeah, so that's my, 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 my point. So I disagree with uh, basically what has been said there. Because by, by trying to link in that way, uh, we misunderstand what econometrics is, right? Okay, uh, there is, sorry. Oh. Yeah, it is uh, okay to test the predictions of Islamic economic based on uh, conventional economic theory. Right? Very difficult for me to, to, to answer this. Right? Uh, um, uh, basically, in terms of whether we can uh, the test the prediction of Islamic economic theory based on conventional economic theory. Right? Uh, for example, we agree that Islamic economy is equity based, the opposite of conventional economy, which is debt based. Some scholars associated the debt based fi finance economic theory to boom bust cycle. Can we test this hypothesis using conventional theory to support the positions of Islamic economics? Right? Now, uh, yes, you can demonstrate that the debt-based finance is basically the subject to the boom-bust cycles, right? subject to the boom-bust cycles. You, you can test. Right? But by testing this, it invalidates or it, it just basically testing uh, the conventional theory of uh, boom-bust cycles. Right? But then it may not support the Islamic economics because you have not tested whether equity base also subject to boom bust cycles, right? So you have to test also the, the equity base, uh, whether it's subject to boom bust cycles or not, uh, which is basically, if you take the stock market to be equity base, for example, is stock market subject to boom bust cycle or not? So you have to test that one also, right? It can be extended, but then it's not so strong for me to, to say that by saying that conventional is bad, it means that Islamic economy is good. Right? Yeah, we cannot say in that way. So that's why you must have your own predictions uh, for you to be able to test. And Islamic economy say that, and uh, if Islamic economy say that uh, a nation that are equity based are less subject to boom bust cycles, then 
we have to test the relationship between <coughs> equity-based financing and the boom bust cycles, right? Uh, in, 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 let's say in the credit market, for example, right? Or in the financing market. So those are type of things that you have to look at, okay? Okay, one. So I think the uh, times is uh, above uh, what has there been. Is, there is one okay. question I think we miss, uh, Prof. Yeah. The first one is how can we, we as researchers work towards developing Islamic economic theories? Oh, but I think you th that will be answered in the in, by Prof. Matbits, I would say, because I think his, his title is developing uh, theories, right? Because uh, he's, he's the right person, right? But, but then, <coughs> The, 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 the thing is this, right? Uh, different people have different views. Uh, whether you have to start from scratch, right? Or whether you can use whatever you, uh, uh, you, you have right now, right? Uh, in conventionals, uh, but then to use what we term as Islamizations uh, of knowledge and try to modify it to be in line with uh, basically uh, basically with the, the Islamic notions of uh, economics, right? But, but let, let me ask you this, right? If, for example, right, I want to develop the theory how banks should allocate, they should allocate their financial resources to different type of contracts, right? One is equity-based contracts, Musharaka and and Mudarabah, another one, uh, debt-like contract or sale-based contract like Murabah, Ijara, and so on. Okay? And I will try to understand uh, the allocations of debt resources to those two contracts. Okay? Now, if, let's say, okay, if, let's say, I build up the theories okay, that say that, okay, uh, if I, you, if I, I build up the theories like this, right? My expected return from Musharaka would be, let's say, the equal to A, but then Musharaka contract have risk, right? Of business risk, because we share the risk. So basically the bank uh, have also need to share the risk. So you have certain risk. But in terms of Mudarabah contract, for, in terms of debt based contract, the risk is less, right? The risk is less because we have collateral and so on to the extent that we can say that it's, it's almost free in terms of the risk, right? And I try to allocate in those two. So if, for example, I adopt the, 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 the modeling from the conventional finance right, by putting in this risk and return trade-off and try to optimize, right? If I do this, I just want to ask you because I do not know the answer. Right? Is this in line with the principle of Islamic economics? Yeah. Because Islam said that I, can, I have to do the best that I can. That when you do something, do the best. And I try to do the best and look at various combination of risk and returns. And I try to pick the one that gives me the best one in the context of return and risk trade off. Yeah. Is this contradicting Islamic economics? So that's something that you have to answer before you know whether you can work. Uh, how can we work toward developing Islamic economic theories, right? Because a lot of things that have been established so far has been ignored. Why? Because uh, for me, right, uh, we tend to put that on the side by using the value. If we want to use the value, for example, in developing the theories, then try to look at institutional economics. And then you, have, you will see uh, the importance of values in uh, developing the theories. So, so I just want to ask you that one, right? If, if, if I want to optimize my, uh, my profits, right? Uh, under the ambit, uh, in the confinements of all available, all allowable permissible action by the theories, by, by Islams, right? Is that contradictory, right? So which means that I specify the, the I put the price in, I specify the demand functions, right? Because demand function depends on the price that I put in, right? And I specify my cost and so on, and try to maximize to get the best uh, profits possible. Uh, I, with the restriction given by Islam, for example, which means that in optimizing, right? In developing the product, I don't cheat. 
I specify the product correctly. I specify there's no garage in there. There's no uncertainty in there. Right? Is that contradicting Islamic economics? Right? Or is that contradicting Islam? So that is the one that you need to answer. Right? Because as I mentioned, we miss out a lot of developing Islamic economic theories because we are big occupied too much with what is permissible and what is not permissible. That one importance, but we cannot forget the fact that out there, there are many alternative causes of actions. Within the permissible sets, there are many different options that we can choose, right? Uh, that we can choose, right? And choosing that best alternative means that we try to optimize. And if we develop the theory on that, right, can that be considered as Islamic economic theories? So that's what you have to answer. But remember the saying of the prophet that said that you know more about the affair of your worldly affairs that regarding certain things that people coming up and the prophet give opinions, but the opinion of prophet doesn't turn out to be right. But then the prophet said to them, these are the worldly affairs, you know more. I can give the opinions that regarding the dates. Right? I give the opinion. My opinion may be wrong, right? but the, the Sahaba believe that this is a revelation, but then it's just the opinion which means that out there, there are alternative course of actions on how to do things, how, uh, how to do things in terms of your worldly affairs. You have to choose the course of actions and choosing the course, the best course of action is economics. Is this Islamic economics is something that you have to answer, right? Because I do not know more and I do not want to go to the debates of value free, value uh, loaded and so on type of building the frameworks, right? Because uh, me is more of econometricians and I'm more of uh, someone who wear the objective hats, right? Not so much of normative hats, right? So that's basically uh, what I can say in terms of this case. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much to Prof. Mansour Ibrahim for your insightful uh, explanations. Uh, now we already reached the end of our session for first session today. Uh, I'm still curious. Is Prof. Mabid, uh, are you here already? If you're not here, uh, Prof. Mansur, you want to say something? Your last words? No, I, I do not have anything. So while we are waiting for Prof. Mabid, if anyone else need to, would like to ask some things, right? And 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 my word is, it's only that. My views that I say is just my view. It may be right, it may be wrong. As researchers, right, you have to build your own way of, uh, you, you have to basically uh, research on your own and to build your understanding. And the most important part of building understanding, building knowledge, right, never uh, basically stick to the past as presenting our understanding. We have to rethink the past to get a new understanding. And that's why chromatic is so important for us to test, retest, and retest because phenomenon changes, thing changes, assumption changes, environment changes, right? So there may be new changes. So that's why we have to continuously look at the knowledge. What I've said here is based on my past knowledge, my practice, it may not be true for in the future. The same thing here, right? And that's why in one of the talk that I, I give, right? The opinion of the scholars in the past, great, great scholars in the past, their opinion of the past doesn't mean that that opinion need not be subject to revisions. You have to revise them if you want to develop a new theories and a new understanding, right? Revising the opinions or contradicting the opinions of the scholars in the past doesn't mean that we, uh, so, sometimes people are not, people are afraid to contradict the opinions of scholars in the past, but then in the context of knowledge, you have to debate. Uh, but of course, there are certain methods, certain approach, right? Because we 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 only criticizing what has been. We we can say that this imam and that imam is wrong, right? Uh, uh, is wrong. Uh, that opinion is wrong. We apply into the present context, for example, right? So that can be done. But the problem that if we are afraid, our knowledge will start in the past, but a lot of things have changes, they have changed. So if we want to change things, we want to change our understanding. We have to really look and rethink a lot. And that's why chromatic is so important for us to relook, really rethink, and retest. Right? Something that I believed before, that I found out before, may not be something that is true now. So that's a really important part. 
So that's the dynamic of knowledge that you have to look at when you try to do research. Right? And that's why getting something unexpected, getting something is, uh, that you are not uh, familiar with, uh, is, is basically maybe uh, you open the door to the new knowledge. And that's one very important part. Okay? So as I said, uh, we are waiting for Prof. Bits. If Prof. Bits here or not, if not, uh, if you have anything to ask, for example, so I, can, I can stay for, uh, let's say, a uh, few, few minutes before uh, Prof. Bit take over. Okay, I have one question to you, Prof. Okay. Uh, I see your last slide, you mentioned that we at least need to learn two software of econometrics. Yeah. So may you, may you uh, state what are the software? And my second question is, if I'm not mistaken, uh, econometrics basically, as what you have mentioned before, is as a means to, you know, uh, to not validate. It, is it the word validate you use the theory? Yeah. Uh, okay. So if to validate, so it means that uh, I don't have to learn all the models, right? I don't need to, you know, know a lot of models. I just need to know models that are suitable for my research because they are only the means. They are not the purpose for me to prove this is econometrics model or what, right? So is, is it correct? My understanding is correct? Yeah, no, the, um, see, the, the, the first one first, two softwares, right? And in fact, if, if, if you want to be uh, basically applied researchers in the future, for example, uh, two software may not be, uh, two software that I mentioned basically the, is the pre-packaged program. But then if you can learn modeling, uh, or, 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 or the, if, you, if you can learn programming on yourself, that would be a good tool. Because when you learn programming on yourself, you put yourself ahead of others. But when you learn software, software is put by the business, uh, uh, by the business firms, they sell to you. And this pre-package, right? And the new, new thing have not been incorporated in. But if you have to learn two software, I think uh, right now the, in, in Islamic finance, uh, the data that has been used would be either uh, time series data or panel data. And a lot of work have used panel data right now. So the two software that you need to use, I would suggest Stata, one thing, that's Stata, as well as the second one, eViews, right? Just use those two. But then, if you have time to learn more, for example, the learns programming, uh, either MATLAB or R programming, for example, because a lot of codes have been written like right now in MATLAB and R programming, especially the codes that are uh, the, uh, that are developed for the for the for the for the econometric method that just has been uh, that have been published. Right? So, which means you are going to be the first persons that that, that use. Uh, that methods if you know on how to do the programming on your own, right? Now, when I said validate theories, uh, you said you don't need to learn a lot of techniques. The answer, you still need to learn a lot of techniques, right? But for the purpose of your thesis, of course, you just need to learn the technique that are right for your objective, right? But then do not look uh, uh, just at your thesis, look at beyond your thesis, right? Because, see, PhD or DBA is to train you to be researchers. Right? And your thesis is just basically the, 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 the proof that you are researchers. Right? But then to be real researchers, you have to have a lot of ammunition. You have to have a lot of skills. You have to have a lot of methods within you. So it's no harm to learn a lot of methods for your future. Right? But as of right now, right, you just, just believe me, right, uh, in terms of this case. Only during student time, you have a lot of time to learn. Once you go out to work, right, you are not going to have a lot of time to learn. So this is the time that you learn all the techniques that you might be possible to learn, for example. Right? Learn all of them, even if you use only one of them. You use panel data, try to learn time series. Uh, you have linear models, try to learn non-linear models, for example. Try to learn a lot of things. Try to learn many estimation techniques that are available out there, not just the least square regression technique and so on. Why? Because these are very important for your future. Your thesis might need only one, but your future might need a lot, a lot more. And that's what I try to say in the context of, uh, uh, of, of uh, learning many, many different types of methods, right? 
but then the job chromatic is to validate theories but in the context of your thesis of course you need to learn only one or two for example but that doesn't mean that your learning process you stop there and take opportunity to learn more because once you learn more there are many different ways to do things you have become more flexible right so that that's uh, in the context of uh, econometric as testing of the theories Good. okay thank you prof uh, if we don't have any more questions i think we we'll, we will end yeah. your session today okay. and while waiting for prof Mabit, i think we will take around five minutes or 10 minutes break okay thank you to you prof Mansur ibrahim for your enlightening talks i will send my my uh, slide to you and then uh, you can share with all participants okay, okay. Thank you. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum to all of you and thank you for having me and uh, any weaknesses that I have has come from me and hopefully well, all, yeah, all of us can benefit uh, from, from the very small presentation that I have. Uh, thanks again. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam Thank you. Thank you Prof. Ansar Ibrahim. Okay. Thank you. To all participants, we are still waiting for Promabi. Promabi, are you here? So we will take a break around five to ten minutes. Eh? Okay, thank you. Please uh, just uh, make sure you are you are still around. So you, you won't miss when we start the session. Just wait for around five to ten minutes. I will try to contact uh, Prof. Mabit. Thank you.
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Uh, I'm sorry uh, there were the, there were some hiccups in the beginning because of the time difference. I just prayed Fajr and I'm, I was trying to make dua. Now I'm ready. Let me get uh, my uh, slides to share. Yeah. It, it is okay, bro. We understand. Uh... Or you, or you have. You have the slides with you, you can show them, or shall I get, get them from my computer? Uh, you, you want me to share? Sorry, you, you want me to share or you want to share? Let me, let me get them. It would be easier for me to control them from my own side. Uh -huh. It's okay, Prof. Uh, uh, we understand your condition because it's uh, around 6.30 over there. So just make yourself comfortable and we will be okay with it. Uh, it is a time difference, you know, it's uh, uh, you're sitting your clock in, uh, in Southeast Asia too far from us. So <laughs> what can we do? What can we do? Five hours difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, so uh, here we are. Now, uh, the uh, I'll tell you what it might it might be easier to do it. it uh, you have the slides, don't you? Uh, yeah, I do have this. You want me to share? Yeah, why don't you put them on and share them with me? Because it looks like it will take me some time. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, I, let... am a, I am a little bit slow in the morning. Uh, okay, we, we I, I will share I will share this slide. We are five minutes. Okay, it looks like uh, we're in now. Uh, all right, just uh, uh, give me a signal when uh, you want me to start, uh, and I will. Uh, I'll be with you, starting and following those slides. Okay, for sure, Jama. Uh, okay, Pro. Before we start, I would like to read about your uh, biography first. Is it okay? So now we have our last speaker today with a topic about developing an Islamic economics model, a case of Islamic microeconomics. And this, this last session will be chaired by our prominent uh, lecturer, Prof. Mabit Ali Jarhi. Now he is in Ankara University, Turkey. Prof. Dr. Mabit Ali Muhammad Al Jarhi was the winner of the prestigious uh, ISDB 2019 prize. He was also member and secretary of the Sharia board at the Dubai Financial Market. After graduating from Cairo University in 1960, he completed his graduate studies at the University of Illinois, University of California, UCLA, and finally obtaining his PhD in economics from University of Southern California in 1975. Fahmabi has held many high-ranking positions in his, his long-standing career, including Professor of Economics and Finance, Faculty of Islamic Studies at Hamad bin Khalifa University in Qatar, Financial expert and head of training, Emirates Islamic Bank, President, International Association for Islamic Economics, Director, Islamic Research and Training Institute, IRTI IDB, Chief Editor, Islamic Economic Studies Journal, uh, also Director, Economic and Policy Planning at Islamic Development Bank, Chief of Research and Senior Economist, Technical Editor at the Joint Arab Economic Report, Secretary General, Council of Governors of Arab Central Banks, Arab Monetary Fund and Economists at the Institute of National Planning. He was also the former author of a yearly economic report on Islamic finance in the UAE and Gulf, 
having taught economics at American and Egyptian universities, and has participated in establishing several Islamic banks and introducing Islamic banking laws. He also has published extensively in economics and Islamic economics and finance, and just produced a textbook on Islamic macroeconomics. I think uh, probably already produced several Islamic macroeconomics books. Hence, I would now would like to invite Prof. Dr. Mabi Ali Muhammad Al Jarhi to deliver his talk. Please welcome. Also, to the participants, please, if possible, open up your cameras so the, the speaker can interact with you better. Thank you very much. Jazakum uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Wan. I mean, um, uh, so let's start. Shall I, uh, shall I uh, start? بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم هب لنا فتحا قريبا سهلا ميسرا فيه نفحة من علمك وحكمك وقبس من نورك وهداك وساعة من توفيقك وسدادك ورزق من العمل الصالح والعلم النافع الذي ننفع به الإسلام والمسلمين وننتفع به معهم يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم حفنا بملائكتك وارزقنا قبسا من نورك وهدنا سواء السبيل وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيد الخلق ومن تبع سنته إلى يوم الدين Okay, I think uh, this dua I have already mentioned So uh, let me uh, first of all saying that we are now at a different stage of development in Islamic economics. And Islamic economics is branching out into six fields. Uh, one of them is uh, fiqh of Islamic economics. And this would be the derivation of Sharia rules related to economics from Quran and Sunnah. And that requires uh, very uh, specific specialization in Sharia and Arabic language, Quranic studies and Hadith studies. So uh, we leave this to Sharia people. Uh, this is not the job of an economist. So uh, I would like to pass this message to my uh, colleagues in Islamic economics. Do not attempt do not act like a Sharia person. Do not attempt to draw rules from Sharia. You will, يعني, this is not your specialization. You have something that you, I'm, don't, I'm not saying that's more important, but it is more related to your specialization. And it is of central importance also to Islamic economics. The second field, if I move to the next uh, slide, uh, that's uh, the, no, no, uh, let's go on, go on, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to summarize that. Uh, so uh, the history of, econo of Islamic economic thought is the other branch, second branch, and uh, there are people who write articles about, uh, about uh, uh, say, Ibn Khaldun, uh, Al-Ghazali, etc. And uh, this is not really Islamic economics. This is history of economic thought. And of course, but we have, I would like to stress here that the Shaybani is the father of economics, both Islamic and conventional. He's the first man, he's the one who wrote the first book in Islamic, in, in economics. And uh, Ibn Khaldun is the father of analytical economics. So the fatherhood or the parenthood of, of economics is, uh, belongs to Muslims, not to Westerners. So let's forget about other Adam Smith as the father of economics. He is much, he's, he's one of the, of the yani, uh, uh, grandchildren of our economists. Uh, 
So, and then also the economic history of Muslims uh, to study how Muslims lived and how they, uh, what, what were, were their uh, economic indicators, uh, growth, uh, GDP, and so on. And we can maybe we can compare different uh, stages, the Ottoman Empire, uh, the South Asian Muslims, etc. So, uh, but the most important, the core of Islamic economics should be analytical Islamic economics. And that would be the use of economic tools to analyze economic behavior under two uh, constraints, Sharia adherence, as well as dealing with scarcity. So uh, this is what Islamic analytical economics, and we use the economic tools, and how we draw our methodology, we draw it from uh, the father of uh, intellectual analysis, that is uh, Ibn Rushd, and also uh, his companion scholar, Ibn Tufail, uh, so, and the approach actually can be summarized in two words, deduction and induction. Ibn Tufayl has written a story about Hay ibn Yaqdhan in order to show us how to uh, collect facts and see how we can, how we can prove or disprove uh, theories. Uh, so uh, let's go on with, this, with the slides. Uh, the, uh, uh, no, no, go, go on, please. Go on, please. So uh, we have the, the last one is Islamic economic philosophy. Usually when economists get old, they become philosophers. Uh, now I would like here to just uh, convey a message to all of our, my fellow Islamic economists that we have been stuck into uh, methodology since the middle of the last century. Uh, this was somehow found to be easier for Islamic economics when we got too busy on that. Now we would like to say, let us have start our analysis and stop uh, uh, stop talking about methodology. Methodology is settled that we have rejected uh, pro, uh, wealth maximization, utility maximization, uh, extreme rationalism, instrumentalism, and we have established our methodology already, so we don't need to talk further about that. We Let's get into analysis. So this is the whole thing. Uh, let's, let's go on, please. Go on uh, with the next slide. So uh, the Islamic macroeconomics can be considered as an important revolution against, actually it is the second revolution of economics. The first revolution was launched by Keynes from Cambridge, but it, it failed. It was actually, uh, there was a counter revolution led by the new classics who were also led by Hicks and uh, they Keynes was re, yani, um, well, was rephrased into something called ISLM analysis, which actually destroyed. It made Keynes or Keynesian analysis neoclassical through the ISLM. So uh, our revolution is something much more important. We are trying to present an alternative analysis based on different methodology. And we are also trying to show an alternative economic structure for the macroeconomy. So we are re having a revolution against neoclassical theory, as well as uh, the uh, system, the economic system, of, of market capitalism. Uh, now, 
or the elements of our of the alternative structure uh, is that we have a theory of course it is not included in this presentation but this theory is i call it the 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 fundamental theory of islamic economics which actually uh, debunks all interest rate theories whether it is the uh, uh, theory of uh, uh, loanable funds or the uh, Keynes liquidity preference or in I think you are disconnected, Prof. Let's wait for a while. Uh, am I the only one? I think you guys also... There is disconnection, right? Yeah, so we will wait. For him, little bit. Prof, you are you are muted. Please unmute yourself. I'm sorry. Right, okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. All right. So what I'm saying that we have rejected the theories of interest based on logic, on economic logic, that these theories have a missing link and they are impossible, it is impossible uh, to aggregate all rates of time preference for all, for everybody, all individuals and all commodities in one aggregate, we call it the interest rate. And this is very similar to the Sonnenkain, Mantel, de Bro conditions of aggregating demand and supply curves. Uh, so, so there is an impossibility theory here which nullifies uh, the theories of interest. Second, we would like to move from debt-based money to what we call equity-based money. In other words, in the Western model, neoclassical model, money is created to be lent. So the central bank creates money to give it to the government as a loan and to give it to banks as loans. And whoever gets this money can lend it to others. Uh, but uh, we are having a system in which money is created to be invested. So the central bank creates money in the form of investment deposits with all banks in the economy. And these investment deposits would be used to finance consumption and investment through about 20, 20 contracts of, of investment and finance contracts. And uh, 
there will be a return. Now, this return would be would simply be seniorage to the government, and the government will, can can use it. And uh, through my simulation for the Turkish economy and several other Muslim economies, we have found that seniorage would be many times it would be a multiple of government revenue, government tax and non-tax revenues, which means that the government and Islamic economic system does not need to levy taxes and has a, a great deal of surplus to spend on infrastructure, which means that we can compete with China in the race of growth. But of course, our policymakers have not yet decided to look into our macroeconomic model. Uh, can we go on with the slides? The next slide. So uh, <clears throat> we know that Westerners themselves had doubts about the rate of interest. The earliest, 1958 for Sa with Samuelson, and 1969 with Friedman, they had, or they discovered the, that an economy with a positive rate of interest suffers from inefficiency. Why? Because people would, since money would be costly to use in, uh, in uh, transactions, uh, the, uh, uh, because the cost of the rate of interest simply so people will reduce the use of money in transactions and substitute real resources. If this is a little bit difficult to perceive, uh, I, in the discussion period, we can explain that a little bit more with practical examples. The Hosius efficiency, inefficiency says that in a world with costly information, and this is not the new classical world, the new classical world is a perfect conformation world. So in a world with costly information, people will search for prices, but they cannot internalize the information they get. So they get excess information, they cannot sell it. So they will search less, which means the, the number of searches and the number of, uh, or the volume of transactions in the economy would be below optimal. So this is the second inefficiency due to the rate of interest. And the reason for this efficiency is the dichotomy between uh, finance and trade that we don't have in this economy, we, under this dichotomy, we don't have uh, information specialists. The solution would be to mix trade and finance. And that's what we have in the Islamic banking uh, that Islamic banks would become trade specialists and they can sell the trade so they have no hesitation in searching for prices. Uh, so uh, also, now let's move to the next slide. The next slide, please. Uh, no, the next, also the, the next slide. So, uh, so we would like to design a small, simple model of imperfect information with credit. Now, we know that the new classical model is perfect information and it has no credit. So we are doing the opposite. And uh, my advice to my fellow Islamic economists is if you want to be productive and creative in Islamic economics, do the opposite of what the new classical economists are doing. Yani as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam advised uh, or commanded us to uh, uh, do the opposite of Christians and Jews. So uh, first of all, we do not assume homogeneous individuals like or similar preferences like the new classical. We assume individuals to be heterogeneous. And our axioms would be that each individual 
would have different time. I mean, the same the same individual has different rates of time preference, RTPs for commodities. So the time preference for bread will not be the same at the time bread for milk or meat. Uh, second, uh, <laughs> so this would be this would mean that we have non-homogeneous commodities. The other thing here is that we don't have homogeneous individuals in the sense that different individuals have different time preferences for different commodities for, or for, for the same commodity. So some people might give bread 30% time preference and, and some others would give it 40 or 50 or 60. So, uh, so this is a different non-neoclassical world. Next slide, please. So in, in, a, in, in a world of costly information, people and firms react together. So it's people would react together through their price searching. Firms would react together through price searching. Uh, then we resol the result of these reactions is what we call the emergent phenomena, the quanti quantity or quantitatively uh, estimatable um, value that results from search, from interaction. Just like when two planets are, are governed by gravity and their interaction would cause them to move in elliptical uh, path, elliptical path. So, uh, uh, so this is the result of interaction. So uh, now the aggregation of the rates of time preference into a social rate of time preference would be impossible. And the case, the similar case, of course, I don't have to prove that because uh, three economists have done that before. The SMD or the Sonnenkain Mantel de Bro have shown that you cannot aggregate market the individual demand curves into market demand curves. You, uh, if you would remember the textbook where you learned your theory of demand and theory of supply, that uh, your teacher or your textbook told you that uh, we you aggregate demand curves horizontally, okay? Now, SMD conditions say this is wrong. It is only correct under very uh, strict conditions which, which would render the case trivial. Now, how is that? Well, let's move to the next slide, please. Uh, so uh, downward sloping demand curves for individuals can be aggregated only if all co consumers have the same preference map. In other words, it would be a society of one, like Hay ibn Aqdan in the model of Ibn Tufayl, which was stolen by somebody in the West and called Robinson Crusoe. And uh, also, uh, if the preferences do not change with income, in other words, we have homothetic preference functions. And if you're spending 5% uh, of your income on bread, and if your income double, you still spend 5%. That would be very uh, unreasonable. And it means that you do not have satiation of bread at all. The quantity of bread would increase enormously. You should, it would be illogical to consume all of them. So homothetic functions do not exist by logic, by simple logic. So this is the trivial case, which means that Sonnenkain, De Bro, and Mantel tell us that forget about aggregation. There is no, it is not possible. The similarly, in our model, we cannot aggregate all rates of time preference for individuals or over individuals 
and aggregate them over all commodities, unless we have only one individual and one commodity. And this is trivial. So uh, this is so we have an impossibility theory that actually nullifies all the rates of interest theories. Let's go on to the next slide, please. So uh, now Sonnenkain mental de Bro condition say that you we we cannot aggregate. The demand curve will have a, a, a um, unmanageable shape like what you have in C here. And the supply curve also, we have multiple equilibria, we have instability, uh, the economy is in a bad shape. And this is the best, yani this is the most correct picture of market uh, economy, of market capitalism. Because you know, despite the fact that New classics apply the Marshallian scissors uh, and uh, to the whole economy and say that the economy is stable, has a stable equilibrium. We have, a, this is a crisis prone economy. And from between 1930 and 2008, between the Great Depression of 1930, and the Great Recession of 2008, we had so many crises. Uh, you can count them, probably 20 or something like that. And so, so uh, uh, this proves that Sonnenkain, Mantel, De Bro, the SMD condition uh, is very correct and very realistic. Next slide, please. So uh, there is no single rate of time preference for intertemporal allocation uh, that, that summarizes uh, the preferences of all individuals for all commodities. Uh, prices are not related to the rate of time preference. Next slide. So uh, this is one thing that the new classics ignored to, totally, you have a $10,000. It can buy you many combinations of goods. You can see that each one of these boxes has a combination of goods. And the combination, you, you can have a weighted average of time preference for each combination, but they would be different. The, 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 the weighted average would be different for every combination. So you cannot really assign to a value of money, a unique rate of time preference that you can claim to be equal to the rate of interest. It is not possible. So this is another, it's a further proof of the failure of the theories of the rate of interest. Go on to the second, next slide, please. So if we looked at the, uh, commodity set XT, which each element would be XI, J of T. And of course, we have I for individuals and J for commodities. And uh, we assume that people are mortal. And uh, we have an unpredictable span of life. So we have uncertainty, which would justify time preference and prefer Present consumption is more certain than future consumption. And uh, so each household would have a set of RTPs or rates of time preference, which are uh, can be represented by the matrix of AT. So we have the uh, commodity matrix XT, the uh, uh, rate of time preference matrix AT. Now, what is the definition of the rate of time preference here? It is the quantity of the good in the future. In other words, you are, you, let's look at apples as an example. You consider that five apples today, just an extreme example, is equal to six apples tomorrow. <coughs> so the difference of time preference 
between five and six, one apple divided by five, which is uh, 20%. So this is your rate of time preference represented by this equation. Uh, let's move to the next slide, please. So interest rate theories imply that the relation between present and future money reflects time preference. But interest rate, pre present and future, interest rate between present and future money is some average, that's what they imagine of the rates of time preference. But we have shown that this aggregation cannot be done. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. So uh, what we're saying here, that if you are buying <clears throat> some commodities uh, by, by paying uh, <clears throat> spot prices, uh, that's the second part of the, of the equation here, and <clears throat> paying for part of it for, as uh, in forward prices, then this is the credit. Introducing credit here uh, means that the price of each, for, the forward price of the commodity would be equal to one plus the uh, markup of the commodity. Now, if we are assuming that Islamic banks are operating properly as Sharia would command them to do, which they don't, yani, unfortunately, and they negotiate markups with customers. So the price, the forward price is equal to one, forward price is, we, have, we, we multiplied by one plus the markup, I mean the, the, the uh, spot price, we multiplied by one plus markup in order to get the forward price. So this is the deferred price. And these deferred prices reflect negotiations between customers and Islamic banks. It's a market process that is missing from our Islamic banking model that is applied currently. And we would like this is our other type of revolution that we would like to have a revolution against to reform Islamic, Islamic finance. And we will see that we have, we will come to the justification. Next slide, please. So, but those buying on credit against the fair payment, any, any questions, anything? No? Okay. So uh, those buying on credit against the fair payments would negotiate markups with Islamic banks. So uh, we have an open access finance. In other words, anybody can go to an Islamic bank. We have an open access uh, finance market, uh, finance seekers, and banks are price searchers, and banks do not use a benchmark, for example, LIBOR. Of course, this is not a real assumption, a realistic assumption. Is our Islamic banks, unfortunately, use LIBOR as an indicator for murabaha and so on, and we will show that this is economically wrong. We're not talking about Sharia here. Okay, they will tell you that there is no objection to that. Sharia. As no, you see, it's very easy. Uh, our Sharia boards uh, find it very easy to find textual evidence to uh, justify their decisions. But in economics, we have we are much more strict than that. So markups are functions of buyer's time preference and market equilibrium. Let's move to the next slide, please. So the markups, uh, or we can write the expenditures of any household is equal to the forward prices times uh, the quantities traded. In other words, uh, one plus the matrix of markups multiplied by the price matrix and commodity matrix, plus spot prices times commodities traded at, sp at spot prices. So uh, if we replaced markups with the rate of interest, we will not get the correct result. So interest rate theories imply that 
uh, the EC, ET, EC1T uh, is equal to EC2T, where we replaced the rate of interest with markups. But uh, <clears throat> in other words, the rate of interest on money would be some, some kind of a social rate, some social aggregate, but we have shown that this social aggregate is impossible to calculate. My next slide. Next, please. So uh, now uh, let me go back to the uh, to this slide, uh, your previous slide. You can see here that the RT, the rate of interest, can be equal to the matrix of the markups only if if the if the matrix this matrix can be can has a determinant that can be estimated in one value in its score in a, uh, 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 in one one number one figure uh, but uh, uh, this would be first of all it means that the number of individuals is equal to the number of commodities that we have a square matrix of uh, uh, markups. This is very, very unrealistic. Usually commodities are far exceed the number, the number of individuals in any economy. So uh, let's, so we cannot really uh, reduce the matrix of markups into, into one scalar. Next slide. Is. So, uh, so we can estimate that scalar by an average, weighted average of the elements of markups. And, uh, but uh, this scalar would not result from any known market process. We don't have a market process that combines all rates of time preference into one average, uh, maybe weighted average. average. Uh, there is no time. And uh, you, you know, I want to remind you with the critic, criticism of, uh, <clears throat> of John Robinson for demand and supply and equilibrium. She asked a question. She said, do we have a market mechanism that allows us to reach equilibrium, there is no such thing. So actually, this question uh, destroyed the theory of demand and supply or market equilibrium. And we are doing the same thing here. It's an impossibility theory that this number cannot possibly come out of exchanges in the market. Let's move on. Next slide. So. Uh, those who borrow money, they use money borrowed either to buy goods or to uh, trade in debt and gamble in the market. And uh, we have seen, we have shown before that any monetary value cannot be assigned a, a unique value that represents the average rate of time preference. Next. So uh, we can say here that we cannot assign a unique rate of time preference for an amount of money. This is not possible. And we don't have a market mechanism that provides that. So the rate of interest results, uh, the rate of interest is an administered price by the monetary authorities. So in Malaysia, Indonesia, Turkey, Egypt, whatever, there is a committee for monetary policy. They meet regularly and decide how much the rate of interest is going to be. Well, how, what, how do they estimate it? Do they pull out of the air, thin air, or thick air, whatever type of way you want? It, it is not an equilibrium price. It is an administered price. So we cannot rely on this as an equilibrium price. 
its use of by Sharia of boards as an indicator is, is not a price of equivalence or what we call Thaman al mithl And since it is not Thaman al mithl it is not just to be used. So, and it is not related to the rate of time preference of borrowers or lending. So, <coughs> so that's the idea. We have a theory that's not, that's not correct. Uh, next, please. So in Islamic finance, debt and risk trading are prohibited. Uh, although, uh, yani, uh, uh, some Islamic banks finance risk trading through uh, shares murabaha, which is means that it allows you to buy shares on murabaha, provided that you have to sell them within a few days. So they are really financing, uh, destabilizing speculation, which is against maqasad al-sharia. Next, please. So, uh, the negotiations between buyers and sellers, between uh, buyers of commodities on fo at forward prices or deferred prices, which are Islamic banks and customers, this negotiation would result us, would give us a matrix of rates of, uh, of uh, uh, markup rates. Uh, that depend on market conditions and people's uh, time preferences. The use of these rates would be far superior than the use of uh, LIBOR, which is an administered uh, rate of, uh, or administratively set rate of time, uh, or rate of, rate of interest. Next, please. <clears throat> So such process is a component of sale finance. That's the negotiations between banks and customers. It is absent from conventional finance. Uh, you know, you do not go and negotiate the rate of interest to the bank. It would tell you I, uh, the, the, the prime rate is set by the central bank and I just add uh, a, a margin uh, to, for an, as an estimate for your credit worthiness. Uh, but it is also suppressed in the Islamic finance industry. Who suppresses it? It is Sharia boards. Sharia boards ignore banks' monopolistic behavior, and they insist upon using LIBOR. And they say, we don't find anything against LIBOR in our books. So uh, that's it. Next, please. So under what condition social rate of time preference exists? The conditions stated by Sonnen, Kaim, Mantel, and Debro. One individual, one commodity. It's a trivial case. We cannot use it as a case representing Islamic finance or even conventional finance. Next. So the conventional monetary and financial system imposes an administrative rate of interest unrelated to a mythical market mechanism capable of producing a new classical equilibrium. So this is the theory of the missing link or the impossibility theory that the theories of interest are incorrect. They must be thrown away. The rate of interest is not an equilibrium price. It is an administered price imposed as a premium on buying present for future money. It is a folly to use as a benchmark, a price unrelated to fundamentals of the economy. In other words, you, you go, just to try to go to the uh, Bank Nigara Malaysia or Central Bank of Indonesia or the Central Bank of Terry, only Central Bank in the world, and tell them, how does the rate of interest that you have set today, just after the, the committee has met and set the rate of interest, how does it relate to fundamentals? They couldn't tell you. It would be totally unrelated. So since it is not related to fundamentals, 
How come we have it as a, we use it as a policy tools? Okay, if we used it as a policy tool, what would be the results? The results would be unpredictable. And that's why monetary policies in, in, in all countries in the world are a failure. They do not, they fail to provide stability because they are based on a tool which is administratively, administratively set and it is not related to fundamentals. Next slide, please. So the theory of liquidity preference also in Keynes has the same defect and we can also uh, ignore it. Uh, move to the next, next slide, please. All right, now uh, let's Sorry, go on. I, I will skip, how much time do I have now? Uh, right now it's 12.20. Uh, we plan to finish at 12.45 and then we open up Q&A session for... No, 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 no we, we will finish at what time? In other words, uh, how much time? You're the chairman. Tell me how much time do I have? Uh, if I have any time. Around... Around 25 minutes, is it all right? In 35 minutes. At uh, 25. Uh, okay. uh, so, uh, you mean at uh, 30, 25. Uh, 35, okay. 20, 25. 25, in other words, yeah. four minutes. Four minutes. Let uh, me, shall I summarize in no, four no. minutes? Uh, hmm? uh, no, no, no. I mean, we, 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 we still have 25 minutes uh, left or around in 12. 45, something like that. We will stop at 12.45. Okay, I'll tell you what. I will, I will summarize the results of this <coughs> in a few minutes and request you to handle questions if, if, uh, if there is any. Okay? Uh, the, uh, the most important result of this theory that nullifies the rate of interest, which I call the, fun, the fundamental theory of Islamic economics. Why do I call it a fundamental? Because this, this theory gives us a justification for Islamic economics. In other words, you know, people would come and say, we have had an economic system, market capitalism, the rate of interest, and you're coming, you Muslims are coming and saying, uh, and, and, and giving us an alternative. Why an alternative? We're, we're doing all right. So we tell them our theories, I mean, your theories are wrong, and we have a theory that proves that. So this is the first thing. The second thing, we are, we will design an economic system in which money would be issued for investment that uh, the central bank through getting the rates of return on its central deposits with banks, which are actually investment accounts would, uh, uh, would, would collect seniorage, which now is taken by banks. And this seniorage as we simulated and discovered it is many times government revenues from taxes and tax uh, and non-tax revenue. Uh, the uh, rate, the, 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 the system of uh, fractional reserves would be transformed gradually into a system of total reserves by increasing the required reserve ratio gradually gradually until it becomes 100%. That would, that would guarantee that the government would get all the seniorage and banks will not get any because banks through fractional reserves are allowed to issue money based on uh, deposits. And uh, this, money issue, uh, this money issued is lent at interest and seniorage goes to banks. So we say, don't do that. Only the government, only the central bank is doing so. The government, central bank becomes a, a monopolist of money issue. And this monopoly would, would enable it to collect a huge amount of seniorage. 
Not only that, imagine what happens to uh, the Malaysian economic system if investment in uh, Malaysia doubles many times. And if the money has, if the, if the, if the Malaysian government has the resources to improve the uh, infrastructure indefinitely, uh, so that we would have the best infrastructure, and which means that the economy would, would, uh, would go up to a much higher level of efficiency, and growth rates would be unprecedented. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the, the other thing here is that the government would issue what I call central deposit certificates, which are certificates that uh, are common undivided shares in mudaraba pools of banks, investment pools. And these certificates would be tradable. And uh, the rate of return on these certificates would can be used, and there is a, 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 a uh, there is a specific relationship between this rate, between this rate of return and the real rate of growth. So the central bank can easily use the rate of return on CDC or RCDC to estimate the rate of growth. And at this moment, once we do that. Monetary policy becomes very, very uh, simple. Equate the rate of monetary expansion to the real rate of growth. So there would be an absolute uh, state, a state of, an abs of absolute price stability. No inflation, zero inflation. As long as the rate of monetary expansion is equal to the uh, uh, the real rate of growth. Also in fiscal policy, we have a lot of seniorage collected to be used in infrastructure, and we can have a uh, portfolio of government projects to execute at times when we wanted uh, expansionary fiscal policies, but we will not need a, a, a deficit for that. We will use our seniorage to carry on expansionary monetary policy. And if we needed contractionary monetary policy, we can do the same. It is even less, uh, yani, uh, uh, less difficult. All right, Mr. Chairman, I think we can stop here. And if he, there are any questions uh, about uh, the macroeconomic model or the uh, fundamental theory, of, his, of Islamic economics, uh, I will try to answer, but I, but I, I do not guarantee. Uh, Pro, um, it's still, it's still early. You, you want to continue first, or you want to pick up questions? Yeah, I think I will. If there are questions, it's up to you, Mr. Chairman. If there are questions, uh, fine. Uh, there is one question from yes. Brother Muhammad Michel. He asks, "Could you, Prof?" kindly recommend a few books and readings on economics to build a solid foundation in the field? Yes, uh, I have my own book. And uh, this book is uh, freely available for free access on the uh, internet. And I will, uh, in a few minutes, I will put the link on the chat. I will put the book link on the chat. It is called Islamic, it is called the uh, uh, economic analysis and Islamic perspective. Okay, now this uh, Islamic, this, uh, this, this is the first volume. Uh, it took me three years to finish this book, unfortunately, because I, I am an old man and I'm, I'm, I'm a slow uh, writer. So, uh, uh, yani, uh, but the second volume was also going on slowly. But I, the first volume is related to microeconomics. Let me get you the link if you uh, allow me to look into my email. And uh, 
let's see now here. I think I've sent it yesterday to some group. Uh, let me see here. <clears throat> Uh, in case I uh, I cannot find it now, and uh, it, uh, it, uh, if I looked for really for it, uh, yani, uh, it it may not, uh, yani, uh, it might take too much time. So I in case in case I can find it right away, I'll send it to you by by uh, by email. But uh, I think I have found it here. Let's see now. Uh, okay, this is the book, and it's it it's a link, and uh, I put it on the chat. Uh, so uh, let me here it is. So, uh, so we have here, you have the link, all right, to the book. Uh, other books, we, an Islamic economist would need a book that summarizes the critique of uh, neoclassical economics. And uh, this critique has been done summarized very well by an author called Steve Keen in a book named Debunking Economics. And it is, it was published in 2011. So uh, if you wish, I could send you by email, Mr. Chairman, a copy of the book. You can distribute it if you want to, but it is available in the market. Okay, Steve Keen, Debunking Economics. So I have proposed to you two books. The second volume of my book, please pray for me so that I can finish it uh, يعني, in one or two years about macroeconomics. Okay, thank you uh, very much. Uh, yeah, yeah, please continue. Yes, I mean, the, I just want to know also, I want to uh, say that, that the first volume of my book is also available uh, through ISRA, that's the arm of INSEF in Malaysia. But it is also freely accessible on the internet. You can download it free. But please don't print it. It is يعني, it's not environment friendly to do that. Okay, any questions, Mr. Chairman, that you would like me to answer? There is next question by Brother Akshim Afandi. Uh, Prof, would you please elaborate the setting of money supply growth equal? Uh, sorry, Prof, please elaborate the setting of money supply growth equal to real economic growth to guarantee price stability. Is it expected rate of economic growth or actual? Thank you. Yeah, okay. I mean, uh, here this is what we call the Fisher's equation, that uh, the <clears throat> Fisher said that the rate of interest is equal to the real rate of growth plus the rate of inflation. Uh, I use this uh, equation so in the absence of the rate of interest by saying that the rate of inflation, <clears throat> if the rate of inflation is equal to the rate of growth, it means Yani literally, that there are uh, as many, there are uh, there, there is money in circulation in proportion to the goods produced. So the prices would have no reason to to uh, to rise. We would have eliminated the monetary sources of inflation. Uh, so uh, the equation between real growth and monetary expansion or monetary growth is necessary to keep the prices from rising. For 
Once you stop rising pri prices from rising, you have no inflation. Okay, there is uh, another question by brother, by sister Khairunisa Musari. She asked at the end of the slides, there are lots of explanations about suku. Most Islamic economic scholars have argued that suku can be used to finance the establishment of wakaf. However, there is a disagreement. The establishment of what? Wakaf. 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 Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, however, there is a disagreement on the integration of suku and wakaf into single structure by historian. In Indonesia, the integration of suku and wakaf is manif manifested in the cash wakaf link, link suku CWLS instrument. What is your opinion about the integration of suku and cash wakaf? Well, you see, I am, uh, yani... Sister Khairun Nisa, yani she wanted to grab, to, to push me into Islamic finance. Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, Islamic finance is part of Islamic economics. It's a small part of it. And uh, usually people in Islamic finance entertain a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, fiqh questions whether this is allowed or not. Uh, the monetary, of course we have in the macroeconomic, Islamic macroeconomic model, we have uh, two grand, I mean a sector of two branches, a grand sector of two branches, zakah and awqaf. The proceeds of zakah according to my model, are used to finance micro projects to be, whose titles would be given to the poor, so that the poor would be self-supporting. The objective of zakah to me, from my own point of view, is to enrich the poor, make the poor rich. What do you mean rich? Productive. So we give the poor the, uh, the uh, ownership of productive assets so that the poor can be productive. So this is social justice plus economic development at the same time. Now, Awqaf, what is it supposed to do in the model? It's supposed to provide services, public services, education and health. Why education and health? Because we want, when you are in university, when you are teaching in university like me, and your salary is paid by waqf, and the student tuition is paid by waqf, I can say what I want. I am independent from the government, politically independent. And that was why our scholars in the past were able to stand in front of tyrant and totalitarian rulers and tell them stop it and give them instructions. Uh, when the uh, Mughal attacked the Middle East and reached Egypt and uh, there was the Mamluk, uh, the Mamluk uh, ruler of Egypt at that name Qutuz, he collected or he, he, he he made a meeting of scholars and he said, I need to raise taxes in order to finance the battle. So one of the scholars said, uh, Mr. Ruler, with all respect, if you do not, if you need taxes to finance the war, you must, you are the property, you and your, your army are property of the people because they were Mamluks. They were purchased as slaves and then put in, drafted into the army. So they said, you sell yourselves first before taxing the people. The people are suffering from over being overtaxed. So this cannot be said by somebody, somebody who takes his salary from the government. 
So Awqaf gives us a really functional education sector or the education system. Now, how do you make Awqaf? How do you spend? How do you spend? Do you make them as cash Awqaf through uh, Sukuk or through anything else? Uh, cash Awqaf is allowed. It, and no matter what you say about it, uh, it is allowed. <coughs> now, in order to have cash Awqaf, you don't have to have Sukuk. Uh, you can have, you know, now, nowadays you can have what we call uh, crowdfunding. Uh, you can have any of the means used in uh, Finantec uh, in order to uh, make Awqaf. But Awqaf is very, very important and very critical at a time of Muslim history, economic history. All of our schools and hospitals were financed by Awqaf. Not only that, when the poor gets sick and goes to the hospital, he gets treated, he or she gets treated, and also paid uh, sufficiently because sometimes poverty could cause malnutrition. So uh, we help the poor to uh, uh, give them uh, uh, grants in order to improve their uh, food, the, yani, their food intake. Please don't ask me about Islamic economics. Uh, don't ask me about Islamic finance. I, 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 I am interested in creating a generation of Islamic economists that can have a dialogue, can have a dialogue with the students of Sam Wilson and Friedman, uh, and also a dialogue of their policymakers that we have an economic, a macroeconomic model that is superior to what you're applying in our country. So please apply it. So that's the type, this is my mission, my message in life. Anything else, Mr. Chairman? Uh, we have another one question by Brother MS. I'm sorry, Prof. Uh, it may be due to my lack of readings, but why do I feel that very few economists talk about signal rich as monetary policy too? Uh, the reason is simple. Monetary and financial economics is the most difficult branch of economics. Of course, you know, uh, usually when you talk about, when you ask economic students, what fields would you be worried about from uh, or hesitate in take, taking they would think of, econo of mathematical economics or of econometrics. But uh, math mathematics and econometrics are simple uh, because per perception is simple. It is only equations, okay? But uh, in uh, uh, monetary and financial economics, the question, the how to perceive monetary the monetary phenomena and the fiscal phenomena is complicated. So that's why we don't have many people getting into this area. Uh, fortunately for me, alhamdulillah, that was my luck. I specialized in this area when I was studying PhD for my PhD in the United States. Uh, but I encourage our schools to popularize monetary theory and monetary and, and, finance, and financial economics so that we can produce more Islamic economists that, that uh, work in this area. Okay, Prof, there is no more question, but I have a question to you. Uh, my question is, uh, when, when I try to argue with people, those in the, especially in the Islamic banks, uh, those who have background in Sharia, or in other words, those who learn in fiqh rulings, I try to argue with them by saying that for you to implement Sharia, it's not enough for you to just implying from the, uh, from the ruling of fiqh. I mean, the, the, the currently understood fiqh. But 
it is hard for me because I'm not from the Islamic background, those in fiqh. So, but is it my argument is correct that in order for us to say that we want to implement Sharia in Islamic economics and finance model, that we need more than the legal basic ruling of fiqh that is supposed to, you know, incorporate uh, all other knowledge too. But I don't know how to argue myself. So what, what, what you think about it? What, what will be your argument to those? Uh, well, my yes. advice to you, Mr. Chairman, is to start with validity. Your Sharia board tries to make sure that your transactions are valid. Now, what is validity? It has two branches. It is formal validity. In other words, contracts have to fulfill certain formal conditions. In other words, a sale contract should have a buyer, a seller, commodity price, etc., etc. Okay? Delivery uh, conditions. Uh, but the other, and this is, of course, fuqaha are experts in this. The fiqh al-mu'amalat, which actually an economist can, can uh, master it in, in six months. But uh, fuqaha make a big deal out of that. Yani, uh, are, do we have any fuqir so that can confirm what I say or not? Do you need more than six months to master fiqh al-mu'amalat? Any faqih? No faqih here. Looks like the title of my of my uh, yani, my lecture has yani, uh, uh, did, I mean was not very much liked by by fuqaha. The second and most important part of validity is validity of purpose. What do you mean validity of purpose? That we have maqasid al-sharia in economics. What are maqasid al-sharia in economics? They are full employment, uh, balanced growth, balanced and sustainable. In other words, does not harm the environment. Uh, and also, social justice that we don't shouldn't have uh, differences, big differences between the poor and the rich. So stability. So if you make any transaction in Islamic banks that violates one of these maqasad al-sharia, you are committing a sin. So let me give you an example which I had mentioned before, uh, shares Morabaha. The bank gives you, buys shares for you and charges you a forward price, which include markup, provided that you resell your shares within four, five, six days. So this would be financing speculation. And it's, it's financing uh, speculation which is of the type of destabilizing. So that is against the stability which is maqasid, one of maqasid al-sharia. So you as a sharia board in a bank when you approve this, this uh, transaction which they do it is allowed then you are violating maqasid al-sharia. You shouldn't do that. So that's what you, you tell them. Uh, that uh, now there is another sad, sad thing that uh, that I wish to say uh, about Islamic finance. Uh, we are getting closer and closer to being conventional finance. We have done, we are doing all the sins of a conventional finance. And, uh, but in a worst case, how is that? You know, when the British wanted to destroy the Ottoman Empire, they tried to convince the Bedouins to fight against the Sultan, the Ottoman. Of course, this was a very great loss for all Muslims because this was the only Islamic state we had. And it was protecting our, our lands from colonialism. So what happened? They 
sent a spy to this to the Arabian Peninsula in order to convince the Bedouins to fight the Ottomans. What would be this? Would this spy wear a coat, a, I mean, a tail coat and a, a tie and so on? No, they gave him an Arab robe, Arabian robe, Arabian headband. You see what I mean? And uh, they taught him Arabic. And he also, they taught him the uh, phrases that we Muslims say, Alhamdulillah, MashaAllah, La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. So people thought he was a Muslim. He was dressed and appeared like a Muslim, but he was kafir inside. He was kafir inside. Now, the, the, the first people who uh, tried to play tricks on God were the Jews. Uh, can, I, uh, can I take f five more minutes to answer, to, 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 to explain? Mr. Chairman, you agree? All right. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have, we have lots of uh, more minutes, bro. If Around you have many 10 questions, to 15. I can stop. I can stop. But you see, Jews had some kind of ruses, a ruse to fish on Saturday. On the day that they were prohibited to work, they dug holes next to the shore so that. Uh, fish would jump into the hole and they would, they would collect them on, uh, on Sunday. And uh, they thought that they did not fish on Saturday. We, in Islamic finance, we may do a lot of fishing on Saturday. And uh, you see, fishing on Saturday has caused God to tell the, Jew, the Jews, Kunu qiradatan khasi'in. Yani be apes. Be like apes. Do we Muslims want to be like apes? So we're telling our Sharia boards and all Islamic banks, please stop hila, stop ruses. Uh, keep Islamic finance unique. Uh, stop the, uh, the, 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 the movement of Islamic finance toward, toward conventional finance. We want to bring Conventional has closer to us, not the other way around. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for being patient with me. Thank you a lot to Prof. Mabi Al Jarhi. Uh, is there any more questions? If there are more questions, any last word from you, Prof? Before we end our session today. Yani, Mr. Chairman, if you want to give me a few words uh, or the last word, I am really, I want to stress the importance of analytical Islamic economics and the importance of the Islamic macroeconomic model in which we are replacing debt-based money with equity-based money. And uh, also we would like, I would like to stress that we should stop talking about methodology. There are big names in Islamic economics that still talk about definitions. I have a new definition for Islamic economics, big deal. We know what Islamic economics is. We don't need the definition, new or old. So we'll, I'm telling my distinguished brothers and sisters in Islamic economics to stop working on methodology and start some economic analysis and give some of your efforts to analytical economics, analytical Islamic economics, so that we can carry the message on. And the moment you can have, or your students can have a dialogue with Western economics, this is the moment I, I consider that we have succeeded. Okay, Prof. Jazakallah uh, for such enlightening lecture. Uh, we from Center for Islamic Economics and friends of Center for Islamic Economics uh, really thank, thank, really feel thankful for you.
to you. Sorry. And uh, I think we already reached the last session for our programs. Hence, uh, I would like to tell everybody we now reach to the photo shoot session. Brother Firdaus, are you still around? Uh, Brother Firdaus? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, we now reach already to photo shoot session. So, please, everybody, turn up your camera, turn on your camera. I'm sorry, and then uh, we will have a photo shoot session. Okay, ready? Okay, one, two, three. Okay, one more. Okay, one, two, three. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Yeah. Uh, Insha'Allah, we will benefit a lot from your textbooks and we are still waiting for your another textbook. Hopefully, mm -hmm. we will, <laughs> hopefully we will uh, meet again. Some people are asking for the slides, so please feel free to give it to anybody that asks by email. Some, Inshallah, I Inshallah. saw in the chat some this request and I have no problem with that. Anybody can give the slides. Inshallah. Inshallah. Now we already reached the end of our session. I would like to close our program today with Tasbih Kafara and Suratul Ans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to everybody that attended. And uh, can I take leave now? Ah, yeah, sure, Prof. Thank you. Thank All you right. very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamualaikum. Uh, thank you, bro. Mafid. Thank you, bro. Mafid.